The second person, unfortunately, is sick, and Dr. Carpenter is going to kindly read uh, her paper, and the third person will be uh, online. Um, I'd like to say a couple of things about Linda Klein's presentation. She's from Boise State University. I did not receive a resume, but she will say a few things about her own work and how her paper fits into her uh, research. Um, her paper is entitled Tartini, the Art of Boeing, which is a topic that's, of course, of tremendous importance for performance practices. And so I'll turn the word over to Linda. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Linda Klein. I am professor of viola and chair of the music department at Boise State University. And it's my pleasure and my honor to be here. So thank you. Thank you, Alex, for, um, for your kind generosity and having me here. So I will begin. Uh, it's wonderful to follow such a lovely performance uh, that featured the art of Boeing. I'm going to be speaking about the art of Boeing and doing a, a few demonstrations near the end. So um, I just wanted to read my abstract out loud to get people on, on the same page of what we're going to be doing here. Uh, Giuseppe Tartini's The Art of Boeing, A Theme and Variations, is an important Boeing study, but additions from Tartini's time to the present are conflicting and no autograph manuscript has been found. This session will give an overview of additions and demonstrate Tartini's intent of practicing passages starting both up bow and down bow. Most editions used today do not exhibit this important pedagogical Boeing scheme. There were four different editions of the art of Boeing in the 18th and early 19th century, most noteworthy among them being an edition by Leclerc in 1758, and editions in three publications of Cartier's Art of the Violin from 1798 to 1803. The Leclerc edition is important because it was circulated during Tartini's lifetime. The Cartier edition claims that the source used to prepare the edition was given by Tartini to a friend and was finally passed on to Cartier. Most modern editions, however, are based on the Mariscalki edition from 1786. The Leclerc and Cartier editions resemble each other, while the Mariscalki differs widely. The differences among these are striking, including the number and order of variations, slur markings, and articulations. Tartini himself advocated the use of practicing passages starting both up bow and down bow in his Rules for Bowing, a document not in print until 1961 when it appeared in Tartini's Treatise on Musical Ornamentation. The art of bowing is structured in four bar phrases, each of which is repeated. Therefore, if the phrases are bowed a certain way, a performer who began with an up bow would find herself on a down bow for the repeat of the phrase. The Cartier edition exhibits Boeing's that follow this rule, making this edition particularly valuable. While neither the Leclerc nor Mar Mariscalki editions exhibit this Boeing scheme consistently. This session will provide a closer look at how the art of Boeing may have been conceived in terms of the inherent Boeing scheme found in the Cartier edition, and will include demonstrations of this Boeing scheme. When Tartini was about 24, he immersed himself in bowing studies and experimented with bow construction, using one that was slightly longer and more responsive. It's possible that the earliest form of the art of bowing took shape during this period of intense study and experimentation. Tartini taught at his violin school for 40 years where he was known as master of the nations. To put it in perspective, his school was begun about 25 years before the violin treatises of Francesco Gimignani and Leopold Mozart. But because Tartini never wrote specific instructions on violin playing in the form of a treatise, we don't really know what or how he taught his students. It's likely that the art of bowing was one of his primary teaching materials. His own obsession about bow technique would have likely prompted him to provide his students with a tool for mastering the bow. Elements of his pedagogical style may be traced to material in his treatise on musical ornamentation, first published in Paris in 1771. Two Italian manuscripts of the treatise were discovered about the same time in 1957. One was acquired by the University of California at Berkeley and the other in Venice. The Venice manuscript is particularly important because it contains a section not included in the Paris edition or in the Berkeley manuscript copy. 
In the Venice manuscript is a two page section entitled Rules for Boeing. This document sheds light on Tartini's approach to Boeing techniques and may be applied directly to the art of Boeing. For instance, in Rules, Tartini explicitly advises students to practice each passage of music starting both up bow and down bow. Only one edition of the art of Boeing, the Cartier, has this alternating bowing idea built into the work. The bowings allow one to alternate practicing each passage starting both up bow and down bow without having to ever retake the bow. Some believe that the Paris edition of the treatise deliberately omitted rules for bowing because it did not reflect the fashion of the times in Paris. And we'll return to this thought in a moment. Aside from his work as a famous violinist and teacher, Tartini was also prolific and widely published composer. He was, however, uninvolved in the publishing of his works and was rarely aware if and when his works were published. The problems concerning the chronology of his publications partly stem from the lack of dates ascribed to his extant works, which was typical of the day. However, this may have been deliberate on Tartini's part. He often returned to previous works to revise. With the art of Boeing, what we have is a result of this process, a series of versions of the same work, each representing the period of time that it was revised. So now on to the editions, and if you have the handout, um, if you could look please at page two, which just shows um, a, a chart sort of showing the two groupings of editions, uh, one based on Leclerc, uh, and one based on uh, the Mariscalki. The Leclerc edition was first published in 1758 in Paris. This edition, based on what, to be, what appears to be the earliest print devoted exclusively to this work, is an example of a copy that was circulating in Tartini's day. This edition contains a theme and 38 variations. Mariscalchi's edition was published in 1786. Mariscalchi, an Italian music publisher and composer like many publishers of the day, was often guilty of using unauthorized material. He was eventually arrested and exiled for his dishonesty. This edition is strikingly different from Leclerc, most notably in that it contains 50 variations. While the musical content of 38 of the variations conforms to the 38 in Leclerc, the order of variations is completely different. In fact, from the second variation to the end, the order of variations in Mar Mariscalchi differs greatly with the 12 new variations mixed among the original now jumbled 38. However, the last three variations in both editions are the same. So variations 36, 37, 38 in Leclerc are variations 48, 49, and 50 in Mariscalchi. The last variation of Leclerc's ordering is conspicuously brilliant and finale-like in character. So it seems that Mariscalchi arranged the order so that even with the 12 additional variations, the most dramatic would still come last. This Mariscalchi order of variations was maintained throughout much of the 19th century and remains in many of the popular editions in use today. The next important printing of the Art of Boeing appeared in all three editions of Cartier's Art of the Violin. In the first edition of Cartier's anthology published in, in 1798, Tartini's Art of Boeing has 38 variations in the same order as the Leclerc edition. At first sight, Leclerc and Cartier look very similar. And we'll return to this idea in a moment. The first 38 are in the order of Leclerc and Cartier's first edition. And the additional 12 variations are placed as variations 39 through 50. These additional variations are also present in Mariscalchi, but as previously mentioned, the ordering of all 50 variations is very different. The third, the third edition of the Cartier from 1803 is identical to the second edition. In Cartier, a title page for the work in each edition is given as follows. Quote, the Art of Boeing by Tartini, engraved after a manuscript of the author belonging to J.B. Passeri, end quote. We are to assume that this Passeri manuscript, which has never been found, was the basis for Cartier's edition. In the preface, Cartier says that Tartini had given the manuscript to Passeri as a token of their friendship. Then Passeri gave it to his son, who in turn passed it on to Cartier. Now I want to return to the idea, the, the uh, booklet of rules for bowing, where Tartini advises students to practice each passage of, mu of music starting both up bow and down bow. 
Only the Cartier edition contains consistent bowings, which allow one to alternate practicing each passage, starting both up bow and down bow without having to retake. In the preface to Cartier's anthology, he says, quote, the art of bowing by Tartini is inserted in this work. This piece, the study of which one cannot recommend too much, is such that Tartini had conceived it for bowing, which one could not say of the Paris edition. It's most plausible that the Paris edition to which Cartier was referring was in fact Leclerc, re revealing the differences in bowing intent between Leclerc and Cartier. To his preface, Cartier adds a footnote that reads, quote, I have in the meantime taken the numerical order of the manuscript which I had used being the Tartini original. It did not follow the order which he later observed, end quote. We know that Cartier owned a copy of the Mariscalki edition because it happens to survive. The copy microfilmed by the New York Public Library bears his personal stamp. In the copy, we find handwritten numbers in the margins that delineate the discrepancy in the order of variations between Mariscalki and Cartier. So when Cartier writes, it did not follow the order which he later observed, he is most likely referring to the different order found in Mariscalki. This suggests that the Cartier is providing us with, in his first edition at least, an example of the art of Boeing as it may have appeared prior to 1786 when the Mariscalki edition appeared. Interestingly, the second edition of Cartier's Art of Boeing, which contains the additional 12 variations present in Mariscalki, the 12 additional variations also exhibit the alternating Boeing scheme, whereas in the Mariscalki they had not. So Cartier in his second edition adds 12 more variations after resolute sounding variation 38. It could be said, however, that variation 50 in Cartier's second and third editions makes an interesting choice for an ending as well with its jovial up bow and down bow staccato passages. And I will demonstrate this variation in a moment. Another point of contention surrounding Cartier's editions on the title page to his first edition of the Art of Boeing, Cartier claims to be using the Passeri manuscript. However, his subsequent two editions with additional variations bear the same inscription. Some musicologists question how Cartier can claim in all three editions that the manuscript is Passeri's when the first and second editions differ by 12 variations. I think it's likely that Cartier simply used the same plates to reprint the two subsequent editions to save the expense of having them re-engraved without the Passeri attribution. And so the inscription no longer bears the force of such a claim on the second and third editions, though certainly it was intended as one in the first edition. I had said a moment ago that at first sight, Leclerc and Cartier editions appear to be similar. A closer look reveals many discrepancies of articulation as well as pitch. The most significant difference, however, is the consistent presence in Cartier of this alternating bowing scheme that Tartini recommended in his Rules for Boeing. Because Rules for Boeing had not been published until 1961, remember that the Venice manuscript which contained Rules for Boeing was not discovered until 1957, it's likely that editors of the Art of Boeing prior to 1961 did not have access to this source, and yet editions that have been published since then make no mention of this publication and its impact on the Art of Boeing. Rules for Boeing sheds new light on one of the most important aspects in regard to the Art of Boeing and the Cartier edition that requires further explanation. Tartini wrote in rules, and this is my own translation, quote, with the bow, there are no strict rules governing whether to start down bow or up bow. Instead, it is necessary to exercise passages both ways. So one is free with the bow and develops the same readiness in both down bow and up bow strokes. In the Cartier edition, if the pickup to any four bar phrase is begun up bow, then on the repeat, one finds that the pickup comes on a down bow, meaning that each four bar phrase will alternate bowing direction. This internal structure, which again consistently exists only in the Cartier edition, likely reveals one of the intentions of the piece. Several of the variations in Cartier contain bowings that are so contrived to fit into this scheme that it seems likely that they were adjusted for this purpose. Perhaps the manuscript from which Cartier was working contained bowings that were faithful to Tartini's intention, or perhaps Cartier had access to rules for bowing, or at least knew about Tartini's philosophy on practicing passages starting with bow, both bow directions, and made the bowings in his edition adhere to that practice. 
This idea of practicing passages alternating down bow and up bow has been passed on through generations of string teachers since the 18th century, but only Cartier's edition makes it plain in his notation. This practice opposes the rule of the down bow, which was in fashion for much of the Baroque period, in which players were expected to play the downbeat of every measure with a down bow. Many violinists like Corelli and Gimignani opposed this rule. Gimignani, renowned for his adamant opposition to the practice, advised musicians, quote, not to follow that wretched rule of drawing the bow down at the very first note of every bar. And he even goes so far as to warn against accenting downbeats at all. Because of evolving changes in bow construction, especially the advent of the tort models around 1780, there became less inherent separation between, between strokes and smoother, more connected bow strokes became more common. This resulted in a gradual departure from the rule of the down bow. If bow changes were becoming more imperceptible because of changes in construction and technique, then one would hear less differentiation in up bow and down bow strokes that Tartini and others recommended practicing passages starting both up bow and down bow directly reflects this departure. Most editions used today are based on the Mariscalki edition, partly because of a successful edition heavily revised by the famous 19th century violinist Ferdinand David. These editions maintain the order of variations of Mariscalki and the alternating bowing scheme is hardly ever present. So now we will look at the theme, which you've heard a few times in the, the performance that just happened, um, and then uh, four other variations that I've selected. Um, so I'm going to show you comparisons of editions of Cartier, Mariscalki, and then the more modern editions of Fisher and Shermer, and I'm including my own critical edition, uh, which again is based on, on a comparison of the Leclerc and Cartier editions. So you'll be able to see how Fisher and Shermer were influ influenced by Mariscalki and how my edition is influenced by Cartier. I'll also be playing my viola transcription on the violin part, which is transposed down a fifth because I'm a violist, not a violinist. <laughs> so if you could please uh, look at page three of the handout, um, it shows um, the Mariscalki, an excerpt of the, the theme from Mariscalki, the Cartier, Shermer, Fisher, and then my edition at the bottom. Next page in the handout, um, I'm, I'm going to omit just for the sake of time, um, but I hope you can take a quick look at it just to see the, the vast <laughs> variety uh, comparing the, the four edition, edition excerpts that you see there. Same with page five, I'm going to skip that one as well. Um, and so now if you can please look at page six. Um, you see the Mariscalki, it's listed as variation 17. The Fisher is also listed as variation 17. And then my edition, uh, which is variation 18. Uh, and we'll, you'll see this alternating bowing scheme is um, apparent in, in my edition as well. Thank you. 
Next up is variation 23. And for this, if you could please look at page seven. Next one should be on page eight of your hand handout. I think it's the next page. Is variation thirty two? Variation 50, which should be on the next two pages, 10 and 11 of your handout. Only in 
and that includes curriculum and technology communication, but also in a representation of period techniques as they evolved over the decades when rapid advances were being made in string technique and bow construction. The likelihood that it was used as a teaching tool at the School of Nations, the training ground for so many of Europe's most influential violinists of the generation after Tartini also adds to its significance. Most violinists and violists who know the work today know it from editions that stem from Mariscalchi and thus may have a false impression of the work. Since Tartini's manuscript or manuscripts are no longer extant, problems of authenticity abound, yet not even facsimiles of the Leclerc or Cartier editions can solve these problems entirely. It's ironic that 19th and 20th century editions of the piece contain bowings that adhere to the rule of the down bow, especially as Tartini likely designed the art of bow for a much more comprehensive purpose. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your exciting paper and thank you very much for the illustrations. They made a lot of sense and really put things into context. Um, are there any questions or comments from the audience? Please feel free to phrase them now. Oh yes, it's working. Hi, Linda. Hi. <laughs> thank you so much for, for your paper. I was wondering, um, do you want to recover this, um, this possibility of starting down bow or up bow? Do you think that there is a, I mean, I, I, I assume you do want to recover it. Um, do you see a pedagogical advantage today? Because I was looking at you and you were doing all this kind of like down bow staccato, yeah. um, which to me, if I was thinking about me doing it, that's kind of hard. Yes. Do you think, do you see a purpose in recovering that to a pedagogical purpose in doing that? Yeah, it's such a great question. And I, I sort of pivot back and forth from it. And I, I play in an orchestra where it feels like we talk a lot about bow direction, but it doesn't ever really matter. <laughs> so, um, but I do think that it's a useful exercise to just, pre if you have a difficult passage of music to practice it in, in a different bowing altogether can just give you a different perspective of the of the music itself. So I am interested in it um, and would love to, to, to know more about it. <laughs> That's why I'm looking forward to chatting with so many of you about Tartini too. But um, yeah, I, I think the long and short of it is, yes, I'm, I, I do want to find the answer, but I also think we can we can do Boeing's either way. And yeah. so as a, as a teacher, I want my students to be able to play things in, in every possible way. No, absolutely. But I also was thinking that, you know, you might discover a different phrasing while doing that. So exactly. it's not just kind of like that you might um, face a, a more, a, a passage kind of like in a way that, that it's a bit more difficult and then the, perhaps there's a pedagogical advantage, but maybe you find phrasing in the music that you are not, Imagine by starting down exactly. bow. Exactly, exactly. That's a, a perfect point. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Any other questions or comments, please? Well, thank you for trying out this uh, down bow staccato. It's, uh, <laughs> but it's a kind of staccato that is not really glued to the string. Right. You actually hit the string, and that makes that cl that. Uh, clinking sound. Yes. And, and I was just thinking as you played it, that, oh, how interesting, because in Caprice number no. seven by Paganini, and usually it is played down glued to the string, and it's extremely difficult to do because of the resistance of the string. But exactly. when you, I call that an helicopter bow of sort, <laughs> and, and yeah. it actually is possible to do, and it's, it kind of makes a brilliant effect. It's yeah. just stunning for, yeah. for what it is at, at the moment, but it's actually twice as fast perhaps as this etude that uh, Tartini requires. Exactly. But the link between Tartini and Paganini um, makes the the possibility of that caprice being played this way uh, more plausible. Yes. I think. Yes. Wonderful point. Yeah. So yeah. thank oh, you thank for you. trying it out. Yes, of course. <laughs> thank you. Any other comments? If not, I think we should give Linda another applause. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
We now come to the second presentation by Alenka Donovan from McGill University. Uh, Dr. Carpenter has kindly agreed uh, to read her paper and maybe I'll say a few words about her uh, biography. Thank you. Um, Alenka, unfortunately, is uh, facing some very challenging medical issues at the moment, was hoping um, to be able to present. Thank you. Uh, and unfortunately is not able to. Um, she's uh, joining us to observe online. Uh, what I propose is that in lieu of um, questions, if anyone has any comments or observations to make at the end of the paper, I think that would be um, totally appropriate. And then if anyone has questions that they would like answered in some um, uh, sort of uh, more substantial way, then uh, the participants will, will already have Alenka's email and they could email her or alternately uh, the participants or any of the audience members if they have uh, more substantive questions um, they could forward them to me at the Worth Institute and I could forward them on to Alenka but I'm very honored to have the opportunity um, to read her paper I will try not to stumble over some of the some of the words um, but uh, I'm grateful for the fact that it's beautifully written and I hope you will you will find it so as well. Topics in Tartini, the language of folk music and its influence on the music of Giuseppe Tartini uh, by Lenka Donovan from McGill University. In the 18th century, folk music was a subject of low opinion among Western European musical elites. This was especially true of music from regions that powerful nations deemed under civilized, encompassing their neighbors in Eastern Europe, as well as regions of the Middle East, Asia, Africa, and the Americas. Given the comparatively close proximity of Hungarian, Romanian, and Slavic language populations to the musical centers of Europe, their musical traditions were frequent objects of both attention and derision. When musical references to the folk traditions of these countries appear at all in the Western canon, they are made mostly in jest, good-natured or condescending, or else appear in forms so watered down that they little resemble the original sounds from which they were derived. A handful of composers took a more serious interest in the subject of these telemann, and his passion for Polish music is perhaps the best known, yet even these composers wrote at a remove. The folk music they imitated remained an object of the other, a dialect separate from their own compositional language. But among the composers who treated, uh, who treated with Eastern European folk music, there was one whose relationship with the material and whose incorporation of it into his own language makes him unusual, unusual Giuseppe Tartini. Tartini, a native of the multi-ethnic Istrian region, was a curious character. Though famous as a violinist and pedagogue, he was also an enthusiast of enlightenment thinking. He wrote of his discovery of the third sound overtone as a scientific find. He was a vehement anti-conversionist, um, despite being a devout Catholic, an avid multiculturalist. He taught students from such a, on a wide array of backgrounds in his school of violin playing in Padua that it was later known as the School of Nations, and later in life, a musical folklorist. He collected folk songs, made a point of listening to street musicians, and wrote eloquently about the music of oral tradition as a universal wellspring from which trained musicians could learn compositional and ornamental principles. To better understand Tartini's interactions with folk music, and specifically the traditional music of Eastern Europe European nations, I, Alenka, uh, will lay the groundwork in two areas. First, through the use of topic theory as a device to recognize the folk references in Tartini's compositions. And second, by surveying the treatment of this source music by Tartini, uh, uh, Tartini's near predecessors and contemporaries whose approaches differed from his in important ways. Topic theory de developed by Leonard Ratner describes the way musical styles or idioms take on commonly understood cultural associations, which allow them to be transplanted into different pieces and genres with the expectation that the audience steeped in the same norms will understand the reference. Ratner devised the theory as a response to the frequent and overt use of a quote, thesaurus of characteristic figures, end quote, 
found within late 18th century repertoire. Topics may be drawn from music associated with all levels of society, relying on the presumption that 18th century com consumers would have been exposed to the full range of idioms available in a given context. Topic theory has since found broader interest and application. In Tartini's day, idioms like the, quote, Hungarian minor scale and the, quote, mazurka rhythm would have been familiar to Western Europeans who came into contact with tradesmen or musicians from Eastern Europe even if they did not travel themselves. And composers who worked in proximity to Eastern European folk music would almost certainly have been familiar enough with these topics quote, to incorporate them into their own music. Research on Eastern European topics is relatively sparse. The vast majority of publications concerned with or adjacent to topic theory focus on Western European art music of the later 18th century. There has, however, been a small subset of research that provides insight into 18th century Eastern European topics with emphasis on Hungary and Poland, whose musical cultures are represented ubiquitously in Western European traditions. While some topics assigned to Hungarian and Polish music are recognizable as being regionally specific, others, particularly those concerned with modalities and dance rhythms, frequently occur in the folk music of neighboring Slavic regions as well. Spare as the literature is, an overview of these proposed topics is enough to identify Eastern European folk references in 18th century repertoire, which audiences of the day likely would have understood. One chapter of the Oxford Handbook of Topic Theory investigates the influence of, quote, Turkish and Hungarian gypsy styles, end quote, beginning in the 18th century. Catherine Mays groups the two stylistic influences together for two reasons. One, arguably most interesting, but treated much less thoroughly due to a scarcity of research, is that there are in fact identifiable stylistic links between Turkish and some Central and Eastern European traditional music. This is a poorly researched area in general, yet the Hungarian music historian um, Benz Sabolsi uh, traces the quote, rebounding thirds, typical of much Western music a la Turca, to the Hungarian um, Torokos, a dance originating in central Hungary during the period of Ottoman occupation. The second and better supported reason is that representations of both cultures in Western music were fundamentally Western constructions. Rather than representing faithful incorporations of actual, uh, of actual Hungarian or Turkish traditions, these Western constructions tended to lump the two together as representations of the uncivilized or under-civilized other. Over the course of the chapter, Mays identifies stylistic features of Hungarian music representations that made it uh, through the translation from folk music to the works of Western composers. And here, uh, quoting uh, Catherine Mays, duple meter, regular four measure phrases, major mode, in this case with a brief excursion to the relative minor, exclusive or nearly exclusive use of tonic and dominant harmony, a simple and repetitive accompaniment pattern, and a melody composed of short motives or cells themselves often constructed of chordal leaps or circling figures, which favor repetition over development." Ending quote there. These features are borne out by scattered but similar observations in the 18th century record. For instance, C.F.D. Schubart, writing in the, the 1780s, defined Hungarian gypsy dance music as being routinely in duple, duple meter and containing in his words now, bizarre modulations. The latter likely refers to some of the brief modal shifts common in many Eastern folk tra traditions, which do not obey the conventions of Western tonality and may subsequently strike the unfamiliar ear as unprepared modulations. Mays also argues that Hungarian gypsy music was primarily associated with dancing while Turkish music was closely tied to the military tradition of the Janissaries, and these associations in turn carried generic and syntactical implications. Stephen Zahn, in examining the relationship of Telemann and his contemporaries to Polish traditional music, comes to similar conclusions. Telemann was a rarity among 18th century composers in that he had both direct contact with and apparently genuine appreciation for folk music. Zahn suggests he was, quote, perhaps alone among his Western European contemporaries, regarded Polish music as something more than another exotic topic, end quote. Yet even Telemann was prone to describing it in terms of the, quote, barbaric beauty. 
and his contemporaries, for the most part, treated Polish music little, if at all. When strains of it do appear elsewhere in 17th and 18th century Germanic repertoire, they usually do so as pastiche elements, embodying the, quote, perceived incoherence and irrationality of Eastern European traditional music, end quote. The style polonaise is thus placed squarely alongside the stilo al turca and um, stile hongrois as another Western European representation of an other and whose genuine folk elements survive the transition mostly as topical references. Some links survive uh, more clearly than others. Zahn cites the research of Klaus Peter Koch in identifying melodic and rhythmic similarities between Telemann's Polish flavored works and Eastern European melodies from manuscript sources. Zahn includes a lexicon of musical exoticism, in quotes, essentially a topic table covering the 18th century uh, style al turca and uh, style hongrois and the general category of orientalism, which in this case refers to anything geographically or culturally east of Western Europe, spanning roughly from the Balkans to Russia. These topics include drone pitches, uh, crude, unprepared or non-functional harmonies, that's in quotes, uh, quote, jangling ornamentation, re uh, repetitive rhythms and melodies, motoric passage work and lengthy improvised passages, use of triplets and duple time and specific modal inflection, the raised Lydian fourth and augmented second, the gypsy scale, a major scale with a lowered second and sixth degree, and the gypsy minor scale, also called the Hungarian minor or double harmonic minor scale with raised fourth and seventh degrees. Absent from the Hungarian category, but attributed generally to Eastern European music are added parallel fourths, fifths and octaves, extensive chromaticism, irregular rhythms, and generally repetitive rhythms and melodies. In the 17th and 18th century body of work Zahn examines, representations of Polish music are revealed to share most of these characteristics with other European folk idioms. And here's a quote now from Zahn. Quote, aside from distinctive rhythms and metrical characteristics discussed in the table, Polish markers include modal inflections, crude harmony, noisy ornamentation, pronounced rhythmic and melodic repetition, restricted melodic range, unison and octave doublings, drones, and alad zappa and lombard rhythms, end quote. There is currently little scholarship on topics from other Eastern European folk traditions, but I have identified characteristics characteristics of Istrian folk music in the interest of proposing some topical references in Tartini's oeuvre. Uh, Petra Persolia, uh, after aggregating the available research on Istrian folk music from present day ethnomusicologists back through the earliest known transcribers in the 19th century, presents the following list of qualities particular to Istrian music. Now quoting, typical narrow range span, five or six tones, and melodic phrases tendency to be short in length, compact phrase structure, end quote. She notes that, quote, the Istrian tonality functions independently of the principles of Western voice leading, uh, dominant and leading tone cadential formulas play no role in the music of this genre. Instead, Istrian melodies tend to conclude at the unison. Given that the melodies are set in two parts, the cadential formula is horizontally guided compared to the four voiced vertical harmony in art music, end quote. Some of these characteristics have already been topically associated with Eastern European folk music in general, but for the purposes of investigating Tartini's music, the addition of close two-part melodic fragments concluding in a unison is a worthwhile addition to the, quote, universe of topics. With these topics in hand, it is possible to trace references to Eastern European folk music in the compositions of 18th century Western European composers and of Tartini in particular. First, however, I will discuss some common trends among Tartini's contemporaries in order to contrast their use of these topics with his. Most references to Eastern European folk music in 18th century compositions are not particularly nuanced and often not even particularly accurate to the cultures they attempt to reference. Insofar as these composers' upper-class patrons interacted with or were interested in folk music, their tastes tended towards a surface-level interest in the, quote, foreign or lower-class other, end quote, a reductive fascination with cultural primitivism. Even those musicians whose regions bordered on Eastern Europe were not open-minded. Wolfgang, Wolfgang Kaspar Prince 
recalling a stay in Siberia in 1696, described, quote, two beer fiddlers who played such harmony as made my ears ache for four weeks, since the bass player struck up in the ensemble simply as he wished, so that he played hardly anything except loud dissonances, and generally sustained notes a degree above or below the note which would have made an octave with the violin. All the same, this music pleased the peasants there so extremely well, and they became so jolly hearing it, that I thought they were going to break up the room." End quote. Another German musician, the Berlin cantor Martin uh, Fuhrmann, writing in 1706, had this to say, quote, vitium conjunc uh, conjunctionis, the vice of joining, is when musicians patch together old-fashioned old -fashioned passages that sound like the sort of ornaments that country and tavern fiddlers play, or the kind of music that bunglers, field fiddlers, bock pipers, hurdy-gurdy players, and bagpipers like to turn out. But these are not the only ones who play this way. Artists with more grandiose pretensions can do it too, so that anyone would swear that they learned their trade from the beer fiddlers." End quote. This, uh, the mentions of Bach's and hurdy-gurdy's, both associated with Slavic folk music at the time, are suggestive about the origins of these lower-class bunglers and field fiddlers. This condescension towards the musical underclass was not uncommon. Court and town musicians frequently and resentfully found themselves vying with the beer fiddlers. Fuhrman writes of, so, uh, writes of so derisively for weddings and similar social engagements. In fact, this appears to have rankled musicians at the top of the hierarchy so much that several German-speaking administrative provinces enacted legislation to protect the guild musicians' professional interests. Some of the guilds that regarded uh, urban musicians, uh, that regulated, excuse me, urban musicians, banned their members from performing on traditional or folk instruments as a way of enforcing professional standards. The language used in some of the prohibitions bears a strong resemblance to that of Furman and his sympathizers. A ban declared in Württemberg in 1721 decreed that, quote, none of this profession, be he master, journeyman, or apprentice, should dare to make use at performances of sack, pfeifen, uh, polnischerbach, hurdy-gurdy, triangle, or other unmusical instruments of this kind, end quote. While a mid-century statute applying to upper and lower Saxony forbade guild musicians from playing, quote, dishonest instruments, such as the sack, pfeifen, uh, uh, schafsböcke, hurdy-gurdy, and triangle, which the beggars often play when collecting alms and thereby treat art with contempt and diminish it, end quote. It's hardly surprising then that most instance, instances in which Eastern European folk music appears in 18th century art music um, these instances are parodic, mocking, or exoticizing in a manner that reflects more on Western ideas about Eastern European music than on those places' actual musical practices. As the folk Polish idiom was arguably the most popular of the Eastern European set at the time, it offers the largest array of repertoire, but even with a larger pool to draw from, most of what emerges when not utilizing Polish topics for musical jokes indicates its intended Polishness only through those topical references least jarring to the Western ear. Johann Valentin uh, Maeder's Der Polnische Prache in, of 1689 and Johann Heinrich uh, Schmelzer's Die Polnische Sackpfeife of 1665 are pieces that borrow ham-handedly from the folk idiom for comedic effect. Johann Fischer's series of Polnischer Tänze of 1702 and 1705 have almost nothing recognizably Polish about them to, the, to those familiar with the actual folk idiom. The topical references are limited to a scattering of slightly unusual rhythmic emphases, loosely linked to Polish dance forms, presumably to lend them enough of a non-Western flavor to deserve their titles. A number of Polonaise similarly light on references are scattered throughout the repertoire, for instance, the one included in Handel's uh, Concerto Grosso, Opus 6, Number 3, which does include the drone note topic and the second and fourth beat emphasis of the Polonaise topic in the opening statement of its Polonaise movement, but abandons both in favor of more conventional rhythms and harmonic structures every time a soli section begins. The approaches of these composers are something akin to a kind of musical tourism. 
to the extent that they engage with Eastern European folk music, they learned enough of the vocabulary to imitate or denigrate, but not enough to speak with appreciable fluency or to integrate it organically into their own compositional languages. It is from this angle that Tartini stands out as exceptional, as a composer whose interests in folk music traditions was integrative rather than exoticizing, and whose body of work contains a number of striking examples of his fluency in the idioms of the region, uh, the regions where he spent significant periods of his life. Tartini was born in 1692 in Piran, uh, a town in the region of Ist Istria. While Istria had strong economic and cultural ties with Venice during the 18th century, it was also home to the, uh, to the linguistically and culturally Slavic peoples of present-day Slovenia and Croatia. Given that Tartini grew up in this region and, region and frequently returned, he could not have escaped familiarity with local Slavic musical traditions. Um, furthermore, it is almost certain that he studied composition with the Czech composer uh, Bohuslav Cher, oh gosh, Chernohorsky in his early 20s. There is no official record of lessons but Tartini spent four years in the monastery of St. Francis in Assisi, where uh, Chernohovsky was the organist in residence. He also spent two years in Prague as the Kapellmeister of Count Kinsky between 1723 and 1725. It was a consequence of these early points of contact, suggests Lev Ginberg, that his compositional style matured. Tartini, quote, no longer confined himself to direct emotional perception of the ingenuous Slavonic songs or folk dancing with their characteristic rhythms. He analyzed their peculiarities and used them in his own interpretation. Very likely, it is the folk music of Southwestern, the Southwestern Slavs that Tartini draws upon in his use of improvised melodic phrases with an augmented second, which according to him creates, according to Tartini, creates a quote, excellent impression. End quote. Tartini left further records of his regard for folk music as a genre as worthy of appreciation and study as any European school of composition. His letters, treatises, and transcriptions reveal a deep, a deep and genuine curiosity. He, quote, observed and studied the music of farmers, boatmen, and fishermen, end quote. The integration of elements of folk music into his own compositional and performance style was, quote, meant to flatten cultural boundaries and make his music universally appealing, end quote. In one of his surviving correspondences, he expressed respect and fellowship towards street musicians thus, quoting Tartini, everybody, and I mean everybody, must listen to everybody. And that's why in Venice, I used to hand over my coin to those blind violin players because I have learned even from them. In his Trattato di Musica, he took note of the differences between dance movements and musical idioms across different cultures and wrote with affection of Dalmatian folk songs that, quote, have no definite intervals but flow in a prolonged improvised tune, now rising, now falling. In his uh, uh, Regole per ben uh, sonar il violino, he laments that, quote, only a few people, in fact, no one, has made an effort to collect and transcribe orally transmitted, this is in square brackets, musical traditions. Therefore, I have started to collect and transcribe the few that I have heard, but others who have diligence and pay attention will be able to collect and transcribe others that have not been heard yet and perfect the undertaking, end quote. Unfortunately, few remnants of these collections survive, but a handful of his transcription efforts can be found embedded in his collection of 30 uh, piccole sonate. sonate. He was interested in the dialogue between the universality of music as a means of human expression and the cultural specificity in which the individual musical styles and traditions are produced. But practices of composed art music, um, but rather than, excuse me, rather than feeling the need to declare either the transitions of orally transmitted music or the practices of composed art music superior or more valid, he wished to quote, address and solve this duality by integrating rather than rejecting differences, end quote. This kind of integration is precisely what happens in the famous Devil's Trill Sonata. Though the piece exemplifies a peak in the tradition of Italian violinist, violinistic virtuosity, it also borrows from a number of recognizable Eastern European topics in the creation of its unusual and at times unsettling character. 
These topics lend the piece an element of ambient otherness, but without explicitly remarking on or exoticizing the musical cultures that they derive from. The Eastern European elements are handled much the same as the elements drawn from the Galant idiom and the Italian virtuosic tradition as musical objects worthy of employing where they will strengthen or augment a desired effect. The double stops in the opening bars are mostly open fifths and octaves or else quickly resolve to them. Sonorities that are rarely left so bare with such frequency in solo violin repertoire. A significant number of the final cadences also close on octave Gs. In measure six, a non-functional harmony, a ninth, is inserted for a slightly destabilizing effect. The listener is left by the end of the movement with a sense that whatever comes next is not likely to be usual or comfortable. And indeed it is not. A cascade of increasingly frenzied trills so dominate the, sub uh, the subsequent movement that they practically become the main event. The opening figure of the subsequent allegro concludes in a triplet in duple time. The rest of the movement is relentlessly motoric and veers through small fits of faintly jarring chromaticism that often feature the raised fourth and seventh of the gypsy minor scale. Each half of the allegro um, concludes on a chord comprised of an octave plus a raised seventh of the key area. The andante of the final um, andante allegro adagio is comprised entirely of melismatic passages that seem to def uh, defy exact notation with the raised seventh appearing again to lend it an overall Hungarian gypsy effect. And while the fiendishly difficult fingered drone trills are clearly born of Tartini's own imagination, he foreshadows them with a string of other drone bars with a somewhat Slavic flavor. The sonata employs all, all of these topics for effect, certainly. But the effect is not parodic, condescending, or even particularly geared towards imitating a nationally specific folk tradition. Rather, it is a blending of several contemporaneous musical styles in which the musical language of the Eastern European folk fiddler is considered as worthy of learning and borrowing from as any Western European compositional tradition. Also worth examining are the lesser known Piccole Sonate, mentioned previously as the site of some of the surviving transcription efforts. Three movements contain overt and identifiable references to Venetian folk music, the Forlana dance uh, in Sonata Opus 17, uh, Sonata no. 17 in D major, and the Canzone uh, Veneziana and the Gondolier's Aria del Tasso song of Sonata No. 12 in G major, which also appear as transcriptions in an autographed notebook of Tartini's dated from the 1740s. It follows that the rest of the collection might contain other references to Tartini's explorations of folk music, and indeed a number of the movements display colorful examples of the Eastern European and Istrian topics discussed previously. The full collection of Piccole Sonate comprises 30 pieces, too numerous for individual analysis in a single article. A number of general trends towards Eastern European folk music idioms abound throughout the unusual augmented seconds, the periodic appearances of the Hungarian minor, the frequent use of static drone pitches, the wandering improvisatory melodies akin to Tartini's description of Dalmatian folk music, the handful of unprepared shifts in modality, appearing from nowhere and retreating without any acknowledgement that something odd might have transpired. But to highlight just a handful of the more prominent examples, the second allegro from the sonata number 16 in C major relies heavily on fifth and octave double stops and features a rather wild tripletized flourish in measures 33 to 36, which evokes the improvisations of folk fiddlers and threatens a momentary destabilization of the meter at tempo. The allegro assai from sonata number 18 in C major features constant unchanging single note drones, punctuated by only a handful of times by the odd third or sixth. And perhaps most striking, the andante cantabile from sonata number 19 in D major begins each half with two repetitions of a double stop statement in which both voices begin at a relatively narrowed interval and narrow further until they land on a unison on the fifth degree in a manner that suggests a recollection of the two voiced Istrian folk singing style. The movement as a whole reads to a, mu to a musician with a folklorist's bent like a small fantasia on the sounds of Tartini's homeland. And this is the conclusion. At a time when most of the, West, of the Western European musical world regarded the music of ordinary people with anything from arm's length curiosity to outright disdain, especially if that music came from a culturally foreign or economically disadvantaged background, Tartini's approach was philosophically and musically unique. 
Both his writings and his music evince a genuine interest in the diverse musical traditions he encountered during his life, an enthusiasm for traits of Euro Eastern European folk music in particular, and a universalist attitude in his respect, appreciation, and integration of musical forms and subjects from across class, class and national boundaries. By providing an overview of some of the topical references Tartini makes to these folk forms in both his most famous work and one of his most obscure ones, I hope to invite other scholars and performers to engage with this underexplored facet of Tartini's life and music, as well as with the folk traditions that inspired him. And that is the end of Olenka's paper. Thank you very much, Dr. Carpenter, for reading absolutely fascinating account of use of folk music in Tartini's over. Uh, we now come to the third paper, um, which is an online uh, presentation by Victoria, uh, by uh, Adrian Vriens from the University of Toronto. Uh, his paper is entitled In the Image of Bach, Friedrich Wilhelm Bus Sonata a Violino Solo. And uh, I would ask Dr. Vriens to say a few things about his, uh, his bio biographical statements since I didn't receive any materials. So. Okay, I hope, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, marvelous. Uh, so yes, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Arlen Greens. I'm a DMA candidate at the University of Toronto. Uh, earlier this year, I had a stint as a visiting scholar at Cambridge University. And uh, actually I am uh, originally a University of Alberta alumni. So it feels a little bit like I'm uh, coming home even though I'm coming to you today from uh, Toronto. Uh, so my talk today will be steering us north to Saxony for a little bit. And uh, we will still not be escaping uh, Tartini's long shadow. So in 1720, Johann Sebastian Bach inked the final notes on a collection of manuscripts titled Se Solo, a Violino Senza Basso Accompagnato. Now heard perennially in conservatories, concert halls, and Bluetooth speakers, these six unaccompanied sonatas and partitas form the very heart of the violin's pedagogical and concert repertoire. In my own formative training as a performer, I too played Se Solo in universities and workshops and festivals. And inevitably, esteemed guest artists from Vienna or London or New York weighed in on what Bach wanted or what Bach must have meant. What was actually being said in those moments, of course, is that they wanted it to be played a certain way. And like many in artistic rebellion, I found myself drawn to the early music field. And there, respected pedagogues expressed more ideas about what composers like Bach must have wanted, this time with footnotes referencing treatises. And dutifully, I memorized the admonitions of Leopold Mozart and Francesco Gemignani, like some memorized verses from the Bible. Yet I have remained uneasy. Historical treatises are valuable, but an author's poor turn of phrase is enough to leave us baffled. And a book cannot address every scenario that emerges while playing the instrument. In his 1774 treatise, Anweisung zum Violinspielen, Georg Seemann Lulein drives these limitations home, saying that, quote, under no circumstances do I pledge that you can learn how to play the violin through this treatise without a teacher, end quote. I also question the manner in which commonly cited treatises are applied to vast swathes of historical music. In the search for answers to performance practice questions, regional differences, authorial idiosyncrasies, and decades-long gaps are often glossed over for the sake of expedience. And in any event, if we are to celebrate the artistic integrity and creativity of historical musicians as individuals, it seems disingenuous to suppose that a treatise's set of rules can be applied to all colleagues and countrymen of the treatise's author. Yet, we are limited by the incompleteness of the historical record we must make do with the treatises that we have. But it may be possible to identify other data points that illuminate the relationship between, say, Bach's performance practices and those of the common treatises. One resource for this exploration consists of pedagogical scores and exercises from the period. 
These demonstrate in musical terms what a given violin teacher prioritized most. And necessarily, they point out highly detailed aspects of performance practice. If such a teacher was also connected to the Bach family, these resources might point the way to certain performance practices and simultaneously link or distance the Bach tradition from the recommendations of Leopold Mozart et alia. It is for those reasons that we turn to Friedrich Wilhelm Roost. So Roost was born in 1739 and died in 1796. And for most of his life, he was associated with musical life in Dessau, only uh, 30 kilometers from Bach's Kirchen and 70 kilometers from Leipzig. And Roost was a Bach enthusiast from a young age. In his autobiography, he reported playing the first book of the well-tempered clavier by memory at age 13. And he would eventually go on to study composition and keyboards with Friedemann and Immanuel Bach. And as a violinist, Roost was also evidently very highly talented. And he studied with the violinists Karl Hook and Franz Benda. Throughout his life, Roost collected Bach manuscripts and copies, including an early manuscript of Say Solo. Attendees of this symposium in particular will also be interested in a passage from Roost's autobiography, in which he recounts, quote, when I went to Padua, I felt the joy of meeting the father of Italian violinists, the old Tartini. Although he no longer played, for old age had already strained his nerves, I visited to him several times and gained much pleasant and instructive information from his conversations about music, end quote. And while he was in Italy, Roost would also meet with Tartini's students, uh, including Pietro Nardini, Maddalena Sirman, and many other notable Italian violinists. Roost's compositional style was, on the whole, quite creative and contemporary, so he kept well abreast of musical developments across Europe and frequently wrote to publishers requesting the latest scores. His works have a certain concern for novelty and special effects and show the strong influence of the Galant and Thinsamkeit and Viennese classicism. But in 1795, Roost deviated from that style by composing two Sonate a Violino Solo, his most technically ambitious works for the violin. Dating to May and June of that year, these Sonate pay homage to the polyphonic and sweet inspired writing style exemplified by Say Solo even though such styles were significantly outmoded by the 1790s. These similarities to Say Solo are more than coincidental. Roost possessed an early manuscript of Say Solo, and since the Sonate were written at the end of his life, he almost certainly owned that before he wrote the Sonate. These Sonate present some obvious surface level parallels with Say Solo, so they have counterpart dance movements, they have substantial paired preludes and fugues, and even a substantial and technically challenging D minor chaconne. Some of the most salient parallels between Say Solo and Roost Sonate are found in Roost's fugues. Solo violin fugues were really quite rare by the second half of the 18th century and were almost exclusively restricted to two voices. In contrast, the fugues found in these Sonate quickly establish three voices and develop fugal possibilities at length introducing left-hand challenges which meet or exceed those that we find in Say Solo. In these fugues, as well as in other movements, Roost was not aiming to write a Bach pastiche, but rather he was borrowing the formal structures of Say Solo as a kind of container for his own ideas. Rust, of course, may have viewed Bach's Say Solo as pedagogical material and written his own sonate in the same vein. Referring to Say Solo in an often quoted 1774 letter to Forkel, C.P.E. Bach had attested that, quote, one of the greatest violinists told me once that he had seen nothing more perfect for learning to be a good violinist and could suggest nothing better to anyone eager to learn than the said violin solos without bass, end quote. The greatest violinist to whom C.P.E. Bach refers could well have been Roost. Alas, we don't know. Uh, looking to Roost's sonate themselves, there is significant evidence that Roost had pedagogical intent for them. Uh, this evidence includes the title page of the third sonata. I won't be discussing this sonata at length today because it's stylistically very different from the previous two, but its title page outlines a clear pedagogical agenda. And since Roos titled this didactic work as the third in a series of solo violin sonatas, it's reasonable to conclude pedagogical intent for the earlier two sonatas in the series. And some evidence of the Staatsbibliothek zu Berlin suggests that Roost wrote these works for his student, Peter Geert. And uh, finally, 
The contents of the Sonate scores themselves are also indicative of pedagogical intent. So these works have moments of high artistic quality, but they often lose musical momentum to focus on technical challenges. As the violinist Reinhard Goebel has opined about these works, quote, the technical effort and musical result are not proportional to one another, end quote. I completely agree with that assessment, and that disproportionate effort is terrible news if you're preparing the Sonate for, say, a concert, but it's exactly what a teacher wants in a pedagogical work. So, if Ruth's Sonate are at least partially inspired by Say Solo and written to instruct a young violinist in Roost's violin techniques, then any performance practices evident in their writing have significant value to our understanding of technique within Roost's circles, and perhaps even within Bach's circles. In the following section, I will assess two representative samples of performance questions drawn from Say Solo, with reference to performance practices for similar passages which appear in Roost's Sonate. And where possible, these examples are linked to contradictory or corroborating advice from historical treatises. It's important to emphasize that Roost's sonate are too chronologically removed from Bach's Say Solo to be taken as any kind of performance guides for Say Solo. Instead, they're referenced here as evidence of performance options, which a student of the Bach family felt free to employ, and as data points for comparison to treatises. In a few areas of Say Solo, Bach left Boeing's to the performer's discretion. And one such example is the area from measures 35 to 41 of the G minor fugue. One typical modern execution of this section plays triple stops where possible, then transforms the passage in thirds from measure 38 onwards into a rather active passage of 16th notes. Some performers modify this approach to measure 38 onward by striking the open strings as the bottom notes of triple stops and allowing the open D to ring through of its own accord. This latter approach is more palatable to some performers because it hews closest to Bach's notation and is consistent with how the first triple stops in measures 35 and 36 were played. However, the fluidity of these examples is somewhat stymied by the necessity of playing triple stops in the latter half of measure 36. In response, several historically informed performers have ad advocated in their books for a more consistent approach that evens out this kind of uh, inconsistency by treating the whole area as arpeggios in equal 30 second notes. The theorist Joel Lester has reviewed all of these options and discourages, quote, any elaboration of Bach's eighth note writing, end quote. So he suggests just playing it as written, as triple stops. Uh, the Baroque violinist Walter Reiter suggests, quote, we could invent something less structured and more varied, producing more of a wash of sound, end quote. So really consistency is a key question for this passage. Do we aim to maximize the consistency of rhythm and articulation in this passage, or might performers of this period have seen this consistency as a missed expressive opportunity? Turning to the treatises for a moment. Leopold Mozart's treatise exhorts the player to, quote, change and vary the bowing so that he can play even the most labyrinthine runs and yet return the bowing to its order with ease, end quote. He further notes that, quote, the playing of arpeggios is partly indicated by the composer and partly executed at the violinist's own discretion, end quote. Tables of possible arpeggiation options provided by Mozart and Gemignani on screen here portray several fantastical options which are not commonly employed today. For these treatise authors, arpeggios were an opportunity for experimentation and creativity. Several passages in the fugue of Roost's Sonata I would seem to corroborate this reading of the treatises. Helpfully, Roost wrote out his arpeggiations of three note chords during fugal episodes in this movement. So in measures 74 and 75, in the brackets here, uh, Roost notates four different bowing options for the same pattern of notes. The last group even has two overlapping options. Whether these alternate bowings are meant to be performed in the order written or just represent options of what one could do with arpeggiations in general, this evidence suggests that Roost did not envision a consistent type of arpeggiation. A later fugal episode in the same movement introduces other notational surprises. Like many scribes, Roost did not always continue notating slurs in repetitive passages once a pattern had been established. However, in measures 104 through 106, the opposite phenomenon occurs. 
and a pattern which began as separate bows receives added slurs. One could assume that he meant those slurs to be in place from the beginning of the pattern, but this would be rather unusual. In any event, from a performance perspective, the variety gained from bowing the first few figures separately is a plausible artistic choice, which helps establish a harmonic and narrative trajectory in what is otherwise a rather uninspiring passage. Elsewhere, Roost deviates from just dividing arpeggiations into even 16th notes. So in the Fugue of Sonata 1, he introduces quintuplet divisions, and in the Fugue of Sonata 2, he introduces sextuplet divisions. Both of these cases occur at the end of fugal episodes and can be performed as either an acceleration of activity before the end of the episode, or given their technical difficulty, they can also act as a kind of a breaking mechanism to slow activity down into the uh, return of the fugue themes. These examples demonstrate that Roost felt comfortable shaping the trajectory of an arpeggiated section uh, by freely varying bowings and metrical divisions for artistic effect. And together, the evidence from these Roost excerpts and the treatises suggest more variable executions of arpeggiated sections like those found in Say Solo. This might include more types of arpeggiating bowing patterns and metrical divisions, or even revisiting some of those modern habits which treat some beats as chords rather than as arpeggios. Moving to a slightly different topic, uh, another major point of contention in the interpretation of Say Solo is whether to spread three and four note chords upward or downward. An upward spread from the lower strings down to the sorry, an upward spread from the lower strings up to the upper strings is an idiomatic and natural gesture. This is the chord playing that violinists tend to think of most. And it allows for anything from a nuanced ringing voicing for each string to a robust near simultaneous strike. Over the years, Say Solo has tempted many players to spread chords in the opposite direction in order to better preserve melodies which reside in the lower voices of the chord. Up on screen here, there's two examples. Uh, the first is measures 35 and 36 from the G minor fugue, and another more infamous example occurs in measures nine and 10 and elsewhere in the D minor chaconne. The spreading the chord downward is a rather straightforward way to foreground a lower voice melody. But detractors of this practice suggest that it's unnecessary and perhaps even ham-fisted because the listener's ear can fill in any slight gaps in the sound of the lower voice melody. These advocates for exclusively upward spread chords include some big names, Stanley Ritchie, Jaap Schroeder, Judy Tarling, and other leading early music pedagogues. Occasionally, a story is told about how a young Joseph Joachim performed the Chacon for Felix Mendelssohn in 1845. On this occasion, Mendelssohn reportedly took severe offense to hearing downward spread chords, offering the same defense as we just heard about how the listener's ear can fill in the melody. After retelling this story in his book, Jaap Schroeder notes, quote, breaking the chords downwards to stress those bass notes produces, in my mind, the effect of vomiting, end quote. But downward spread chords have very strong advocates as well. I remember performing the Chacon for a prominent mainstream soloist from Russia who absolutely could not abide my lack of downward spreads. I've also even met some Baroque violinists over the years who prefer a tasteful downward spread chord, a preference often disclosed with a tinge of self-consciousness. But when the young Josef Joachim performed his downward spread chords for Mendelssohn, he was not just being a naive youth, he was following advice from the violinist Carol Lipinski, who in turn had heard Say Solo performed that way by Johann Peter Solomon. Solomon was a bit of a Say Solo evangelist, and he's documented as playing the works for others across Europe and England throughout his career. Solomon, like Roost, studied with Franz Benda and was in close proximity to Bach circles. So this Salomon to Lipinski to Joachim transmission of performance practices is admittedly a little bit anecdotal, but it highlights that Mendelssohn was encountering and possibly modifying a performance tradition of Say Solo which dated back as far as the 1770s, if not earlier. Regrettably, historical treatises are quiet about this matter. They don't really describe the kinds of polyphonic challenges found in Say Solo anyway, so this type of question about chord spreading direction doesn't really come up. Some present day sources will reference downward spread chords found in Jean-Marie Leclerc's 1735 violin sonatas, and they are there, but it's 
tenuous to use Leclerc's Franco-Italian practice as any kind of evidence about Bach performance practice. In the Fugue of Russ Sonata I, however, there is some evidence of a varied approach to chord spreading. In measure 116 of this movement, the moving quarter notes in the lower voice very strongly suggest that the chord, indicated on the screen by a white arrow, begins as a downbow and returns quickly to the D string. This is not an example of a full downward spread, of course, but it indicates a diversity of chord spreading options in Rust's skill set. And as a finishing touch to this rather dramatic section of bowing, the downbeat of measures 117 could be bowed as a downward spread again to reintroduce the fugal theme in the lower voice, uh, which is to say the lowest voice, actually. Elsewhere in this movement, Roost also distinguishes between note lengths within chords, offering some more clues to their execution. There are not many places in this movement where the performer must choose a chord spreading direction, but one such location is measure 19. And this measure indicates a full dotted quarter for a fugue theme notated on the bottom of a three note chord, suggesting that a downward spread with its lingering on the bottom voice could be appropriate here. Elsewhere in the sonate, the Largo movement of sonata number two has another curiously slurred quadruple stop moment in measure 52. The first two beats can be played as an unremarkable, normal upward spread chord, and then the next two beats as a downward spread chord. And this would clarify the melodic lines and respect the notation, albeit with a gesture that would seem foreign to many present day performers. As with the case of the arpeggios, evidence from the Russo Sonate is not sufficient on its own to draw definitive conclusions about performance practices for other 18th century works. But in tandem with the other evidence we've discussed, performers might begin to feel freer from dogmatic assertions that 18th century contrapuntal chords must be broken in one way or the other. As a performer, my own artistic instincts, to be honest, still kind of rebel at the sound of a downward spread chord. But perhaps this is a skill which is just underdeveloped among today's performers. With sufficient practice and artistic purpose, perhaps downward spread chords might be executed with as much nuance and care as upward spreads. It occurs to me that as part of my training, I have spent uh, years and now decades playing upward spread chords and perhaps uh, months practicing the opposite. This paper has assessed two challenging areas of say solo performance practices and examined how aspects of Russ Sonate might be used to corroborate or challenge the approaches taken to these areas by contemporary and historical performers and authors. The examples in this paper show that both historically informed and mainstream performance practices have become habituated to so solutions which are only partly supported by historical evidence. Any such entrenching of how we approach music of the past threatens always to obscure the diversity and idiosyncrasies of past performance practices. Roost need not be the only direction in which we look to find information about early Bach performance possibilities. Many other pedagogical violin works from extended Bach circles remain substantially unexplored through this lens. And one of my ongoing dissertation projects is to create an analytical framework which can bring these forms of analysis to bear on other repertoire. By doing so, it may be possible to imagine more creative and diverse approaches to even the most well-worn classic works, invigorating current performances while drawing perhaps closer to the spirit of experimentation and creativity in which composers like Bach, Roost, and Tartini thrived. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome back. Welcome back. Those of us who are here in Convocation Hall, uh, welcome back, friends on Zoom. We have uh, a final uh, session for the, our scholarly presentations, uh, a short session of two papers. Um, the first uh, is Victoria Grenienko and Guillaume Tardif presenting on um, a really fascinating topic, and it dovetails quite nicely with what we talked about in the last session. So this is uh, Ivan uh, Kandoshkin, the Ukrainian Tartini, 1747 to 1804, variations on Ukrainian songs for violins or violin and bass. So, thank you. Hello, thank you for this opportunity to, perf uh, to perform and present at this symposium. 
it's a really great event. Thank you for all the supporters and organizers for all your hard work. So we're presenting on, me and Guillaume presenting on Ivan Handoshkin. Uh, in this talk, we will, okay, seems to be frozen. Okay, can't do my slides. Well, in this um, talk, yeah, you can, you can, you can come in. Yeah, oh, okay. I'm just gonna, <laughs> just I'm not running. Oh. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, so in this talk, we will explore what is known of the life and work of Ivan Handoshkin as an example of musician of Ukrainian ancestry who worked in the Russian court. Discuss background and Ukrainian cultural elements in the context of Russian court in 1700s. Discuss connections and influences of Italian violinists of his day to Handoshkin and explore Handoshkin's variations as Ukrainian as well as compare them to works by Italian and French composers of the day. Um, Ivan Handoshkin, also known as Handoshko Gandoshko, uh, was born in St. Petersburg to a court horn player, Ostap Handoshkin. He is known as the father of Russian violin school and the first professional violin, uh, Russian violinist. He's also called Russian Tartini. However, the history keeps silent is his Ukrainian background. This silence is not unique. For a long time, Maxim Berezovsky, Dmitro Bartnyansky, and Artemy Vedel were considered Russian composers, despite being ethnically Ukrainian. You might have heard of these composers as they are have a lot of choral works and the sacred works, which are quite famous, unlike Handoshkin. Like many other talented Ukrainian children, uh, these composers were brought to St. Petersburg to join the court choir. And for many, it was the only option to get a chance for a better life. There at the court, if Ukrainian wanted to succeed, they had to follow the agenda of the court and present as generic Russians. Another layer of complexity is that Hadoshkin was surrounded and was competing with Italian musicians, being the only ethnically Slavic violinist at the court at that time. Italian musicians like Antonio Lali received monthly payment four times superior to Hadoshkin. They were taught by accomplished teachers. Um, and how did Hadoshkin feel being so alienated in his own country, uh, perhaps feeling inferior to the European musicians. At this point, we can only speculate about the answers as the research on Handoshkin is very limited. The first person to write about Handoshkin was Vladimir Odoyevsky in 1850s. He reached out to archives and newspapers getting limited information about the composer. So that was only 40 years, about 40 years after composer's death. Many contemporaries of Handoshkin, as well as his son, were still alive at that time. And Adayevsky could have acquired much more comprehensive, comprehensive knowledge about the composer. So very few, few information is available about him. Later writings about Handoshkin were published in 1950 by Israel Yampolsky, a brother of famous Russian uh, teacher, uh, and by Grigory Fesechko in 1972. These, um, these works are mostly based on Odoyevsky. So all we have is archive work by Odoyevsky in 1850s. In the past 10 years, perhaps due to the overall interest to Baroque music, a few CDs of Handoshkin music have been recorded uh, by Anastasia Hitryuk, Alexandra Kvetkovska, Nicole Tamestit, and others with liner notes based on the same few sources. More archival research needs to be done in St. Petersburg Central Library and Conservatory in order to obtain new information as all the roads now lead us back to, Handosh, uh, to Adayevsky. Um, however, in this talk, we're presenting context to composer's music uh, as well as highlighting his Ukrainian background, which has not been brought up in Western literature in hopes to encourage new perspective and interest in the composer. My personal interest is that I'm Ukrainian and it's important for me to identify forgotten or mislabeled Ukrainian composers, especially in the light of our current war. Um, Ivan Handoshkin's grandfather, Lukyan, came to the, from the village Veliki Perevoz, Mirkara district, Poltavska province, Ukraine. According to the archives there, Lukyan was a Cossack of Cossack ancestry. 
In the 1740s, Ivan's father came to St. Petersburg to join the court choir as an adolescent. He would have his son, Ivan Handoshkin, seven years later, and a similar destiny awaited for him. According to Adayevsky, Ivan Handoshkin was raised in the orchestra. Ivan proved himself to be an extraordinary talented violinist. From six years old, he was given lessons by uh, Italian violinist Tito Porta, free of charge. At that time, he was retired from the Russian court. There are speculations of Handoshkin traveling to Italy to study with Tertini. However, there is no evidence of such trip. Normally at that time, if musicians from a Russian court went to Europe, it was always proud and recorded. For example, trips of Berezovsky and Bernansky, there's lots of mentions about that. At the age of 13, Hardoshkin joined Peter III court as a violinist and continued in this role in the court of Catherine the Great. Uh, Catherine the Great was keen to maximize Russian appearances to mask her German origin, having an Italian trained violinist from the Russian Empire. Uh, that's, she had a lot of Italian violinists there, but having the Russian, ethnically Russian or Ukrainian, was helping her to uh, re retain this uh, Russian fascination that she had. It is likely that Handoshkin was involved in a variety of court projects, such as performing his famous improvised Russian and Ukrainian folk tunes uh, that we're talking about today, acting as a concertmaster in theater and an orchestra, chamber musician, playing on stage in a ballet, uh, Reign of Oleg, to a libretto by Catherine the Great, uh, with uh, Gaspar Angiolini, uh, the ballet master and Canobia composer. In 1764, Handoshkin established a violin class in St. Petersburg Academy of Arts with 12 students. Um, Grigory Teplov, Bobrov, Kalesin, Sokolov, and Smirnov were his students. Um, none of them became influential violinists or pedagogues, so it's impossible to trace Handoshkin's student uh, lineage. Majority of Soviet violin pedagogues could be traced back to Leopold Auer, which happened later in the 18th, uh, in, um, 19th century. So we have Catherine the Great. Um, um, okay, so Ukraine in 18th century. So a little bit on the background of Ukraine. The 1600s in Ukraine were ca characterized by frequent conflict. The Cossacks emerged in the dominant Ukrainian political and military force in the period. In the period, Ukraine was divided into a Western Polish sphere and Eastern Russian sphere of influence. Broadly speaking, in later century. Um, we saw the decline of Ukrainian autonomy. After military setbacks and the autonomic ruin of Cossacks from participating in endless wars, Russia began a systematic attempt to absorb Ukraine. One of the policies toward dissolving Ukraine was, for example, Peter I's decree of 1720 forbade the publication of all books in Ukraine with the exception of liturgical texts, which, however, were to be published only in Russian reduction of Church Slavonic. A brief period during the reign of Empress I saw a return of some Ukrainian autonomy. Elizabeth's first lover was Alexei Rozumovsky, a Cossack by birth, who convinced her to restore some Ukrainian autonomy. Um, however, this brief period was not to last. Catherine II terminated the legal separation of Ukraine and Russia in 1760s and efforts to dissolve Ukraine intensified. Uh, Ukrainian um, elements in the Russian court. So Handoshkin was born 26 years after the founding of the Russian Empire and the same year that the capital was moved from Moscow to St. Petersburg. Um, and the court was moved there. And many European musicians were hired to work at the court. The Russian nobility was powerful and the role of church was limited. Ukrainian Cossacks, formerly the dominant military and political force in Ukraine were only nominally part of the Russian Empire. Cossack government and their existence as a distinct military force were disbanded by Catherine II in 1775. Ukrainian individuals were presented in all activities of Russian court. There was quite a number of Ukrainian bandurists at the court, so that's the instrument um, in the slide there, most famous being Timofey Belogradsky and his family. The idea of promoting ethnic identity through music would not be established until the 19th century. This is likely why many Ukrainians were engaged in promoting imperial culture and not their ethnic identity. However, there is a curious mention of by Odayevsky about the composer's tie to Ukraine. He states that Handoshkin's solo sonata number two is dedicated to Vasil Mirovich, 
death. Ethnic Ukrainian who tried to overthrow Catherine II by rescuing Ivan IV, the legitimate emperor from the prison and was eventually executed. So that didn't succeed. And Hadoshkin's sonatas were published at the beginning of 1800s when he was no longer part of the court. Now a little bit about Yekaterinoslav Academy. Um, as the, who Grigory Potemkin tried to establish. So when Handushkin was at the court, he was connected to the reign of Catherine II and Grigory Potemkin. Potemkin oversaw the Greek project, the expansion to the south of Russia, Crimea and towards Constantinople. As a commander of New Russia, which was the name for Southern Ukraine, Potemkin kept close with many ethnic Ukrainians to spread Russian influence in Southern Ukraine. An extraordinary opportunity arose for Handoshkin in 1785, when Potomkin offered him a position at Yekaterinoslav Music Academy in what is currently Dnipro city, Dnipro, Ukraine. Immediately, Handoshkin was released from his court duties, received retirement payment, and the new director's salary. The primary challenge that Handoshkin had to face as a music director is that the city still didn't exist. Yekaterinoslav was to be situated at the point where Dnipro River turns 90 degrees south. The potential city was meant to symbolize the ambitions of Catherine to go south from Russia, and the name of the city literally meant glory to Catherine. Between 1785 and 1790, architect Ivan Strapov presented a plan of Yekaterinoslav city with Prabrezhensky Sabor, Potemkin Palace, which was which the only thing that was built, theater, archaeopiscal house, silk factory, and university, along with the music academy or conservatory. Um, the new city was to be built on the hills to remind Jerusalem or Acropolis, and it would have been the first music academy in Russian Empire 80 years before St. Petersburg. So very forward looking. While Yekaterinoslav did not exist, a temporary colony was established in Kremenchuk in a neighboring city of uh, Yekaterinoslav. Giuseppe Serti was to compose for the grand opening of the academy and to teach composition and singing. For four years, Kandoshkin stayed between Kremenchuk and Moscow, likely taking trips with Catherine and Potomkin to see the progress in Yekaterinoslav. Then in four years, Giuseppe Serti was appointed as a director due to some uh, court, um, uh, yeah, so uh, probably related to Serti being favored by Platon Zubov, who was um, the lover of Catherine, the next lover of Catherine, so some of the court intrigue. And in any case, following this decision, Kandoshkin moved back to St. Petersburg, where he was involved in the court of Pavel I, teaching violin and publishing his course. So that establishes his second part of his career, where he was no longer in the court, not involved with the court. He was teaching and publishing scores. So publishing scores at that time was in infancy in Russia. And um, he published through the Russian court at first by Dietmar in St. Petersburg and in Amsterdam. And supposedly Handoshkin borrowed a large sum of money to keep up with publishing expenses. And he died in Moscow at the age of 57 from heart paralysis. Um, maybe Guillaume, you can tell about the music of Tartini and the school. Or... Well, uh, it's just an interesting parallel that uh, Tartini at the time was uh, managing or directing a school, the School of Nations, with, uh, in connection with his employment. And uh, in the case of uh, Kandoshkin, was essentially catapulted there in this, this new academy, trying to, to make it work. But uh, the, the time was not quite ripe. And, and this, is, uh, this is a parallel that you, you can see the wrong place, wrong place. Uh, the right time, perhaps, and in advance of the conservatory uh, system that was establishing itself in, in Paris and in the, the rest of Europe, the conservatory, but it was not quite the time uh, for Russia to go to it. So. Then in 18th century was an important breakthrough in Russian music life, beginning with Peter the Great's policies and followed by those empresses, Anne, Elizabeth, and Catherine II. Many foreign musicians were invited to Russian court, including Galupi, Tretta, so you can see all the names and at the screen. 
in 1730s, Anna of Russia invited an array of Italian violinists to the court. And later, um, some of the musicians, uh, famous violinists, Fiorillo, Pugnani, Viotti came to St. Petersburg for short recitals. Considering Handoshkin's high status uh, at the court, he likely was interacting with his violinists, studying, uh, playing together. However, there, is, there are no mentions of them playing together or any of that in the archives at this point. Maybe there's its own archives, but nowhere published. Tartini's scores were sold in Russia in the early 1800s, including Opus 1, 12 violin sonatas, and Opus 2, 6 violin sonatas. The Lolios specialized in writing of chamber trios. Um, Madonna specialized in writing violin sonatas. So some of these pieces were dedicated to Anna, for example. Uh, some of them are written in Russian. A couple of sonatas are based in Ukrainian folk themes. So that's uh, by Madonis. And they were dedicated to Elizabeth, whose lover was Alexei Rozumovsky, as he was Ukrainian. Giovanni Verokai published 12 violin sonatas uh, for violin solo and bass. These are considered the first secular instrument pieces composed and published in Russia. So now we're going to talk about the typical Ukrainian characteristics of folk songs that could be found in the variations. So we'll look, there are typical motifs of Ukrainian folk songs. And I uh, looked at the study of Ukrainian ethnomusicologist Yakiev Soroker. Uh, he states that when dealing with Ukrainian folk songs, typical does not necessarily mean widespread. It is rather has to do with recognizable characteristics of the song. So something that's typical for Ukrainian folk song is modal mixture, popular for other Slavic nations, of course, especially Czech. Augmented second in minor key between the third and fourth scale degree, syncopations, melismas when singing or also printed, and polyphony. Um, the two other features that we can find in Handoshkin's music is leading, its first one is the leading tone resolving down a third to a dominant. So there are two examples here. Um, so here's the leading tone and it resolves down to the dominant and it's another one so it's a C G minor so a, a lot of the modal mixture so the key shifts so it could be a couple bars in one key and a couple bars in another key but uh, there's another one very similar so we find this in Handoshkin songs quite a bit another one is gritsu mot so motif gritsu so it's my translation as I couldn't find it in English so it's a cadential pattern that consists of the descending minor six to the seven scale degree resolve directly into tonic or to the second scale degree and then to the tonic, more commonly used in the minor key, however, found in major as well. So we'll find this here. So it's a minor six built from the seventh scale degree and then goes down. So these are very common in Ukrainian songs. And one example, so that's perhaps the name of the song is Gritsu is a name. So maybe that's coming from there based on the name of the song. And there's another one, Kozak was having fun, very similar. So now to the actual songs by Handoshkin. So I differentiate two categories of Ukrainian songs by Handoshkin. The first category is based on true Ukrainian songs. And the second is based on Russian folk songs with elements typical to Ukrainian folklore. It is likely that the variations were performed at the court. So the picture that we saw here, so that's the cover from Handoshkin um, score of six ancient songs. So the front page, from 1786 states that the score is quote uh, for the use of lovers of music in the court style by a court musician Ivan Handoshkin. So he was trying to leverage him being a um, court musician, but at that time he was already retired. So they're performed at the court. Uh, um, also, given Handoshkin's ability to perform on the guitar and balalaika, it is possible that these arrangements were also played for peasants. There are recollections of Handoshkin playing on streets and squares. There is also potential that the variations were used for educational purposes in this role at the Academy of Arts. There are sort of pieces, caprices, etudes. Each song and variation clearly covers a specific key with a variety of techniques displaying double stops, ornamentation, bariolage scales, um, 
Brazier's uh, varied bow strokes. His composing concentrates on the lower register of the violin, so it's mostly first and third position. Sometimes it goes higher up, but majority of it is in the lower positions. So here's the Kozachok. So we're going to perform a couple examples with Kiyom. So this is Kozachok is a traditional Ukrainian dance that originated with Kozaks, as the name suggests. It features a two four quick tempo, simple dactylic or anapestic rhythm, so very simple. Kozachok became popular in European courts in the 17th century in Ukrainian folklore. A lot of music for dance has singing origin. So this is just a famous Ukrainian piece and also the name suggests that this is a Ukrainian piece. I'm going to talk about the second piece and then we'll play two of them because I have to deal with the computer. Um, so that after the Kazachok, there is a march. Uh, so it has a modal mixture to relative keys, as we mentioned. So it starts with A flat major and F minor as well. It has a typical Ukrainian cadence motif of Kritsu. So you can see that by the end of the and end of the first line, there is a da 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 da. So you will hear that. That's the theme, and then there are variations, but we're just playing the themes and the variations you will hear later at the concert. Okay, so then uh, the next example is the song Kosari, which means um, wheat croppers. It appears in uh, Trutovsky 1795 book four, so that's a book of uh, Russian folk songs um, after the Kandoshkin publication. It is there with the title, I was sent by my mother in Ukrainian language. Additional Ukrainian features is again the Gritsu motif. However, it is in the major key. So we have Olga Zaitseva Hertz, so she's a PhD student at the University of Alberta. She's her research is in Ukrainian folk songs. So she's singing this song in academic but Ukrainian folk style. Вышли в поле косари, косить ранко на зорі. Гей, ну те косари, бо не рано почали, хоч не рано почали, так багато уцяли. До обіду покосили, гострі коси потупили. Гей, ну те косарі, бо не рано почали. Хоч не рано почали, так багато уцяли. Oh. Okay, so we'll stop it there, so it has many verses. It basically continues the same. I'll move to the last couple of slides. Okay, so the other, so this is the second category where we go to Russian folk songs that have some Ukrainian features or they're unknown 
uh, whether they're Russian or Ukrainian. So there's All My Destiny, where um, it's a popular song that was published. Oh, actually, this is a, another Ukrainian one, I think. Uh, so it's a popular song that was published in 1790, a collection of Russian folk song uh, by Prach and Lvov. So that's another one. Um, so sorry, that it is a Russian one. So it has traditional to Ukrainian folklore, major minor mixture of relative keys. The first phrase is an F major, then it goes to a D minor. Uh, again, we see the leading tone resolves to, down to a third to a dominant, typical to uh, Ukrainian folklore. Another one is I'm losing what I love, where there's again the same, res uh, um, the, the first feature where it resolves into the dominant. Uh, yep. Yeah, so, um, and uh, the last one that's um, the song features typical to Russian and Ukrainian folk song. The chromatic bass line is Russian. Plagal cadences belong to both cultures and the leading tone resolving down by third is Ukrainian. This is a song that we're going to perform tonight at the concert. So you're going to hear theme and variations by Handoshkin. Um, so the other violinists and composers playing violin at that time were Maxim Berezovsky, Gavrila Rachinsky, Lvov, but more research has to be done, especially about Gavrila Rachinsky, who was Ukrainian, who was coming back with tours to Ukraine. Um, some of his pieces are in St. Petersburg Library and nothing is written about him. No scores are available, however, they're there. So I hope that this presentation has provided context to Kandoshkin's music life and his Ukrainian background. I hope it will encourage more interest and research in him as a violinist and composer. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments or observations from within the hall? I have two, if I may. Um, I, the first, I'm just, I'm curious if you know what the source, you mentioned that um, it was suggested that um, Kandoshkin had studied with Tartini, but there's no evidence. And I, I'm just curious about the, the source, if, mm -hmm. if you know, it's a, it's a funny thing to claim yeah, out yeah, of nowhere. So, um, so the, the main one is Odoyevsky, and then is um, Yampolsky and Gibbs, 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 yeah, the Ginsberg, Ginsberg. So I think Ginsberg says that uh, Tartini yeah. went uh, to study uh, with Tartini, but then I think when it was re-edited, so some of the, it says that again there is no confirmation at all. What do you think? What's the reason for making a claim like yeah, that? Yeah, so think? I think I, I mentioned that there is. Um, uh, in Russia, they were really proud if someone went to study abroad. So Kandoshkin seemed to be quite popular and seemed like he put a lot of money in publishing his scores. So if he went, there definitely would have been mentioned unless like there is no reason to keep it secret. Well, at the same time, Berezovsky, it's all over how he traveled and he was really glorified. The same with Bertnansky. So there's nothing about Kandoshkin unless there was another intrigue at the court. There's some reasons that it wasn't mentioned. So far, there's nothing that suggests that he did go to study with um, was Tartini. Okay. The, the other question I have, or I just wonder if you could speak a little bit of, comparatively about Tartini then and Kandoshkin, even though they didn't connect in that way, they, they're, they're connected via this idea of engagement with folk music. But I think in a way, also you, you hinted that another way they might be connected in, in your interest in Kandoshkin is this idea of sort of him having dual identities and kind of trying to recover something of his Ukrainian identity. And Tartini is sort of located in the same, in the same way that he's in this kind of in-between space. I mean, he's Slovenian for the purposes of the Slovenian government. And, uh, but but uh, mm -hmm. as, as some people have, have mentioned uh, publicly and privately, he is in, in other respects, he is in every way uh, uh, a Venetian. Um, and yet, and then you have these two men who are sort of curiously engaged with folk music at a curious time, if that makes sense, that Tartini is, is not a Nash, he's not a nationalist, but he seems to be a kind of musical egalitarian, that he's arguing that folk music is good music and it's music you can learn from. But I wonder about then Kandoshkin because he's, he's pre-nationalistic, 
So, so I'm just wondering if you could maybe, since we talked about Tartini mm -hmm. and, and legitimizing the inclusion of folk music, if you could talk about yeah, I think, in that way. Yeah, I think for Kandoshkin, that's the question that I have is only obviously just my thoughts on that, but he was at the court with a lot of Italian violinists and maybe the only thing he could bring is his rashness because he didn't so let's say he didn't study with Tartini, he didn't have this European school, and that's what at the court everyone were looking up to. So they were inviting musicians who were paid big money, who were put first. So as soon as someone come in, there's all the diaries of Elizabeth II really liking Verakai and Viotti when they came, so they tried to keep them at the court. So there's nothing that uh, the simple son of the court obviously coming from the village just came as a young kid there. So maybe playing the song that he knows the only like his Russian soul, just that's what he had and then some of the techniques. So that would be one of the things that he could bring up to legitimize him at the court and be something that the European musicians couldn't bring. Would you? Would you assume too that in the Russian court, it's not um, colored by the same sort of Germanic prejudices, if if that makes sense, from Alenka's paper, this sort of idea of you must absolutely, um, you know, in terms of aesthetics and in the integrity of art music, you must keep these things separate. You know, never never mix, you know, folk music with with higher art music. Is it, would it be mm -hmm. the case that the, at the Russian court, you don't have that kind of inbuilt? I don't, it doesn't seem like it because it was, um, Russia missed a lot of the development because of the Mongols um, invasion. So the music was vocal before and uh, church. And so vocal being folk. And then suddenly there are all the instrumental music came, but there is no history of development of the Renaissance music. So then what, their vocabulary was the folk music and some of the Ukrainian songs, it could be because his grandfather was Ukrainian, his dad was Ukrainian, he might have heard some of them. So some of the songs are hard to identify, they're not found anywhere. So it just sounds kind of Ukrainian, he might have composed them, might have found them somewhere. Yeah. Thank you. Is there anything beyond the country? Uh, just one thing, maybe just to add, uh, the idea of two violins playing together is is a is a very minimalistic type of chamber ensemble, and you could hear that in in on the street just as well. So, this comment about Tartini uh, learning from the street musicians, I think this is certainly uh, apropos. Uh, the the aspect of nationalism, uh, I'm not in a place to be able to comment on that. Just as how hot was it at the time? We know it's hot now, but at the time, uh, uh, the, the, um, the political implication, the, the overall integration, the, the position of, of, uh, of Catherine as uh, impress uh, pro-European in a big way, uh, but also trying to, to pr promote a, a Russian culture to avoid being pointed at as, as being from German descent or having the, these kinds of links. So. It may have been a, a shrewd or, or a good idea for, for Kendoshkin to get into this music in, in order to try to advance his career. This is something that, that may have been the case, but as uh, Victoria mentioned, the problem is access to any pieces of information that would, would allow us to, to create more claims about that. So uh, hopefully uh, this research will be able to, to continue or maybe to, through intermediaries that will be able to access our archives. But uh, all together, when we think of two violins playing together, simple materials or things that can be used for pedagogical purposes, uh, and still you, you are teaching through the Suzuki method actually these days. And, and this is something that uh, Suzuki was also pr presenting as a concept of using simple tunes that everybody knows, and then gradually gradus ad parnasum, getting uh, complexities through variation. So uh, he may have been using this pedag pedagogically, and he may have used that also politically to help himself in the, in the, the environment he was. But uh, altogether, uh, we sense through these publications at the end, it was also a legacy maybe a contribution to the country, a contribution that to, uh, to his culture and to his people. So uh, things to confirm, but to be continued. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs>
So last, certainly not least, Caleb Koslowski, um, who is a, a PhD student here at the University of Alberta. And uh, the topic, uh, the title of his, his uh, paper very simply and succinctly as our final paper of the day, Global Tartini. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm just going to toggle up the presentation here quickly. Give me one moment. Wonderful. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for sticking around to the last session of the day. I appreciate that very much. Uh, thank you as well to Alex and the Good Institute for, in uh, for setting up uh, today's event. Giuseppe Tartini opens his Opus 2 collection of sonatas for violin, published by the Roman printer Antonius Clayton in 1745, with an unusual dedicatory preface. It has nothing to do with a patron or a potential employer and offers no guide for the reader. Rather, Tartini dedicates the collection to one of his many students, a violinist named Guglielmo Fagieri. Besides the praise he heaps on Fagieri's diligence, his studiousness and his humility, Tartini points out his astonishment and gratitude that his young pupil should have traveled so far to study with him. Fagieri, you see, according to Tartini, was born and raised on the Indonesian island of Java. Java and its colonial capital Batavia, modern day Jakarta, had for more than a century been the administrative and military hub of the Dutch East India Company's colonial enterprise in the East Indies. Much of the Dutch spice trade with India, China, and Siam passed through the port city of nearly 50,000 people en route to Amsterdam and other Europe, major European metropoles. Fajeri, about whom we know nothing except what's present in Tartini's preface, might well have been born into a merchant class family and boarding a ship to make the nearly 12,000 kilometer journey to Venice, for centuries a hub for the Eurasian spice route, would not have posed much difficulty. But the connection between the two violinists raises a host of questions, not the least of which is how Fajeri came into contact with Tartini's music on Java in the first place. How did it get there? Who performed it? What kind of work might this might it have done in the context of or in Christopher Small's term, musicking in 1730s or 40s Indonesia. Most significantly, this kind of evidence and the distinct silence of the historical archive that accompanies it should cause music historians to reflect. What kind of history might we, or should we write about Tartini and his music in the face of such striking mobility? Tartini has often been a quiet and unproblematic figure in music historiography. He's noticeably absent from even the most comprehensive surveys of European music culture. He's nowhere to be found, for example, in Richard Truscan's mammoth Oxford history of Western music. When he does crop up though, it's always in a squarely nationalistic frame. Tartini is an Italian, though perhaps now Slovenian, through and through. Biographers like Pierluigi Petrobelli point to his lifelong residence in Padua, or his publishing exclusively in Italian instrumental genres like the Concerto Trio or Solo Sonatas, a musical inheritance from Corelli, as support for such historiographical categorization. Moreover, they point to his physical stasis after taking up the position at the Basilica San Antonio in 1726. He taught from Padua, turned down propitious court positions elsewhere in Europe, and wouldn't even venture next door to write an opera in Venice. Starting up the Scuola della Nazione in 1728, brought the world to him, not the other way around. But even if the man didn't travel after 1726, a point that I argue we might think about a little bit more critically, his music and his reputation certainly did, as the dedication to Fajeri makes explicit. In my talk today, I attempt to rethink the fixity attributed to Tartini by situating his music within a global scope. By global, I don't implicitly mean the world at large, i.e. the globe. Instead, my use of the term adopts that proposed by historian Sebastian Conrad, that is, the global as a particular way of looking at history, an approach that takes cultural mobility, interconnectedness, and exchanges at starting points. 
This global historical approach means looking at Tartini's world as one characterized fundamentally by connections and networks, many of them stretching across national and regional boundaries. One such network is that brought about by European industries of music print. Locating Tartini and his music in the context of contemporary publishing and circulating mechanisms, specifically those developed by his Amsterdam-based publisher, Michel charles Seine, I suggest reveals a particular kind of global Tartini, one without, or at the very least with blurred borders. A global approach offers us insight here, not only into how his music moved, but also, and perhaps more significantly, how the Padua-bound violinist fostered a truly international reputation. In short, how T Tartini got around. Tartini's business relationship with Le Sen began in 1728 with his first publication, a set of six concerti spread over two books issued a few months apart. A third book followed in 1730, and a set of 12 sonatas, six da chiesa and 60 camera in 1734, just like Corelli's Opus 5. All of these, confusingly, are published as Opus 1. Three more collections followed, two sets of six concerti in 1734 and 1740, respectively, and a final collection of violin sonatas in 1743, only a few weeks before Le Sen's death. These, of course, are the collective Opus 2. My interest in Tartini's connection with Le Sen stems from its simultaneity with Tartini's settling down in Padua, the apparent end of his mobile career. These are his first publications, and he remains in business with Le Sen exclusively until the latter's death. Why? Why engage a printer more than 1,300 kilometers away? Tartini doesn't seem to have ever met Le Sen, and though effective postal systems were in place, his letters to colleagues and friends like Padre Giovanni Battista Martini show that communicating with the Dutch printer for even the most simple matters was often drawn out over a period of months. There are undoubtedly a number of answers to this question. Since its founding in 1696, the Amsterdam Publishing House had developed a reputation for exquisitely engraved editions. In the age of ore texts, we can quickly lose sight of the fact that music print was a costly and time-consuming endeavor that required a musically literate printer, one, moreover, who could write backwards. Getting an acceptable, let alone nice, edition could be a Herculean feat. The draw to Le Sen might also simply have been monetary. He seems to have paid Tartini well for projects after the Opus 1 Concerti, a rarity in the expensive business of music print. But thinking about Tartini's connection to Amsterdam with an eye towards networks and mobility offers two further, and I argue weightier possibilities. Far more significant for Tartini must have been Amsterdam's, in fact, more specifically Le Sen's firm's status as the preeminent center for printed Italian music in Northern Europe. In 1716, Le Sen married Françoise Roger, the eldest daughter of the then famous publisher, Etienne Roger, located on Amsterdam's Beaumarkt. Le Sen ran his own shop, but in 1723, purchased the firm only a few months after Roger's death and following the even more sudden death of Roger's successors, his younger daughter, Jean Roger, and an employee named Gerard Drinkman. Le Sen inherited an astonishing wealth of contemporary musical work. In 1712, Roger had signed a deal with this guy up here, Arcangelo Corelli, to publish his Opus 6 Concerti Grossi. The release of the print, forestalled for two years by Corelli's death shortly after entering into the contract, set off an explosion in demand for Italian music, the blast radius of which was felt from Dublin to Stockholm and London to Königsberg. Roger's publishing house was at its epicenter. Of Roger's approximately 500 editions, nearly 200 are of Italian music for string instruments by composers including Corelli, Vivaldi, Albinoni, Valentini, Gemignani, and Torelli. Le Sen seems to have understood the value of the business model that he'd inherited, and he added more than 100 editions to the firm's catalog, tracks with existing authors like Vivaldi, for example, and also establishing new relationships with artists including Pietro Locatelli and Tartini himself. Roger and Le Sen's centrality should give us pause. Musicologists have traditionally categorized European music cultures of the 17th and first half of the 18th century along a spectrum between two weighty poles. At one end, French music, dominated by the styles emanating from Louis XIV's Versailles, and on the other, Italian music, constituted predominantly by opera seria and instrumental music that we could rightly call the cult of Corelli. Tartini, of course, has fit nicely into this discourse. 
we can point to numerous debates where contemporary listeners take sides and who and do go rather who's better, including the Carrel du Buffon or the earlier 1705 debate between François Ragunier and Jean Laurent Le Cerf de la Vieille Ville at the Parisian Academy. However, such binaries have the tendency not only to generalize, but also to miss out on both the cultural nomadism that takes place among those subjects not at the poles of the spectrum, for example, Dutch, German, or English music cultures in the North, or those connected to Italy via the Mediterranean, both European and non-European. And moreover, binaries disavow the contingency that these monolithic centers owe both to their peripheral others and to each other. In such a model, Amsterdam means little. Many musicologists might be able to point to it as the place where Vivaldi published the Opus 8 Concerti, and if they're really good, the Opus 3. Beyond this, the binary model can only generate questions about French or Italian influences in a peripheral space like Amsterdam. But the emphasis that a global historical approach puts on a trans-border mobility and the resultant reorientation of agents and their trajectories in cultural spaces demands that we redraw our map a bit when it comes to the circulation of music through print technologies. Amsterdam becomes a gravitational center alongside and in dialogue with a host of other printers I'll discuss momentarily. To be sure, the language of the French Italian binary remains a significant dimension of reimagining this space. Roger and Le Seine built their niche upon quote unquote, Italian music. Le Seine's extensive music catalog of 1735 is organized by genre and national affiliation. And the Italian section constitutes nearly 40% of its contents. But what is this classification really doing? Early modern catalogs like Le Sens, as contributors to the University of Chicago's Multigraph Collective have compellingly argued, do a very specific kind of work. They're curated objects, carefully and intentionally organized representations of a collection that are meant to guide their readers through contents in a very particular way. Printers, in a sense, are the creators of imaginary worlds. The Italy of Le Sens catalogs, the Italy at the heart of his business model, the Italy for which Tartini's music here serves as a sonic signifier is precisely this kind of imagined world. Yes, we're dealing with physical music. And yes, the Italian authors included were usually from the geographical peninsula. But I'd argue that this isn't actually what Le Sens is selling nor captures what drew Tartini to publishing in the first place. Rather, publication translates Tartini's music into a commodity form that is a saleable object that has a very particular use value. This translation alienates it from the sonic and the geographical worlds, from the intimacy of sound and performance. Tartini's music here is inventory, one piece of product among many, an inventory deeply enmeshed with northern, northern imaginings of the sensual, sunny Mediterranean South. In this form, the value of Tartini's Opus One sonatas, for example, aren't only the potential of musical experience, but also the excitement of the grand tour, the ruins of ancient Rome, the image of Venice as the world of spice, silk, coffee, and chocolate, and the promiscuous rendezvous carnival season sometimes promised. The magic of Le Sens printing press was the transformation of Tartini's music in some sense, therefore, into a globally representative and transmissible product. This commodity form and the imagined worlds with which it was entangled generated the possibility for Tartini's music to spread quickly across a complex distribution network that was truly global in scope. Like Roger before him, Le Seine carefully fostered relationships with other printing houses in Western European cities. And while these relationships included a healthy dose of competition, historical evidence for their connections illuminates an industry that was actually built, surprisingly, on cooperative business models. The London-based printer, John Walsh, and the Parisian publishing house under Brava Leclerc, in particular, seem to have had convivial connections with Le Seine. The three often served as each other's representatives, selling prints on behalf of the other houses. In some cases, it seems that the plates were even shared between them. Around 1716, when Walsh's firm solidified connection with Roger, Walsh would on occasion imprint his own labels using Roger's title plates, a technique called passepartout. The rationale for these cooperative connections isn't clear, but could readily be ascribed to the lack of international enforceable copyright law. Scholars have usually imagined a rather cutthroat space among early modern printers. Once a print crossed the geographical boundaries where it was protected under royal privilege, and even that was tenuous at best, it was fair game for pirating. Le Seine, Roger, Walsh, Leclerc, all of them printed music, quote unquote, 
illicitly, whether from each other or from circulating manuscripts. The lack of control was a significant risk to printers and composers alike. In a letter to Padre Martini, dated March 1731, Tartini complains angrily about the fact that Lesen has asked him to provide a set of sonatas. The frustration isn't aimed at Lesen. Late the year before, a collection of six sonatas allegedly by Tartini had appeared in Amsterdam, printed by the organist of the Lutheran church there, Gerhard Friedrich Wittvogel. The sonatas are, in fact, Tartini's, but Tartini, it turns out, had never spoken to Wittvogel, nor had Lesen and the organist sometime printer had pocketed whatever money came from the print he'd made from circulating handwritten copies. Cooperation across publishing houses mitigated at least some of this risk. Sharing plates for a price saved both substantial time and money for the copying party and earned a minimal profit for the originating party. Publishers engaged uh, individual agents for the same reason. Copying among publishers is one thing, but circulation by manuscript was an entirely uncontrollable challenge to profits. Signing contracts with composers, publishing houses would occasionally engage them also to be agents on their behalf. Georg Philipp Telemann, for example, in 1748, wrote to the violinist Franz Benda, attempting to sell printed editions of Tartini's sonatas to the musicians at the court in Berlin. Though it's unclear which sonatas in edition were taking up space on the Hamburg Kapellmeister's desk, it could well have been one of Le Sens or a reprint by Boivin Leclerc. Both had published Telemann's music and both had contacted him as an agent to distribute their publications. Cooperation among publishers and the networks of agents they engaged produced an ecosystem where musical print in commodity form flowed quickly and fluidly across borders. These borders, importantly, were not exclusively European. Le Seine connected Tartini's music to the cultural spheres of Amsterdam, London, and Paris by way of these networks, cities that we must remember were not national but rather imperial capitals. By doing so, printers also inserted this music into the multilateral flows of goods and peoples, music and musicians that existed between these cities and their colonial emporia that moored their seaborne empires. Recent research has illuminated, illuminated rather, the extent to which musicking among European settlers across the globe relied on a steady stream of music crossing the world's oceans. Glenda Goodman, for example, has shown that American colonists in 18th century Boston, New York, and Philadelphia waited anxiously for ships that brought, among other things, the newest prints from London of select arias from Handel's most recent operas. In Southeast Asia, David Irving points to an astonishing tradition of Catholic musicking that developed in colonial Manila. Tartini's connection to Fagieri infers at least a similar situation on Dutch colonial Java. European visitors to these cities often measured their cultural health by presence of European cultural staples, especially music. In a city as large as Batavia, it isn't unimaginable that Le Seine just might have had some agents, whether individuals or other printers, to maintain a market abroad, the seller possibly from whom Fuggeri just might have purchased a copy of Tartini's Opus on Sonatas. Following publishing networks takes us far away from Europe, a central goal of a global historical approach. The connections bring us face to face, not only with a global Tartini, but a post-colonial one. And it's here that the question mark in my title crops back up. How do we tell a story of, a history rather of Tartini's music in the face of the violence that European colonization wrought on lands and peoples like, for example, quite possibly, the indigenous Javanese. Global historians like Sebastian Conrad and Dominic Zaksenmeyer often point to the plurality of perspectives a global approach seeks out as a solution. But what do we do when those voices are silent, when the historical archive simply doesn't exist? Can we really claim a quote unquote global Tartini without them? I don't have an easy answer to this question, but perhaps at the very least, the attempt to situate Tartini and his music within a global scope can do some work toward decolonizing music histories by revealing this silence and by illustrating the complex ways in which his music was integrated into larger systems of mobility, exchange, colonial expansionism, and cultural contingency. Part of this, I claim, is also seeing Tartini's history and music as objects entangled with a variety of other cultural objects and the worldviews that they produced. While I focused here on the mobility of Tartini's music through northern networks that served as gateways to domestic and colonial markets, this needs to be kept in dialogue with Tartini's own proximity to Venice, an equally important entrepôt for goods and peoples from European seaborne empires, but also from Asia and North Africa. Venice is a gateway, for example, to the world of coffee. 
including beans from Sumatra. And Tartini's own experiences in Venice might have brought him into contact with the Mediterranean ethnic crucible in which recent studies by Kate Van Orden and Reinhard Strom poignantly show music, sounds, and musicians from around the region commingled. Ottoman influence, for example, was, was an ever-present dimension of Mediterranean life, whether through war or the threat of Barbary pirates or economic circuits that crisscrossed the Mediterranean's waters. International and colonial trade through Venice would have also fed, quite literally, Tartini's insatiable appetite for chocolate. His letters with friends and colleagues are dotted with references to shipments of the tropical commodity, which by this time was not just coming from South America, but also Southeast Asia and Africa, and anxieties that he had about these shipments coming through. In a financial statement from around 1767, which brilliantly begins, quote, Facts that prove the falsity of the assumption that Tartini is a wealthy man, close quote. He lists his annual consumption of chocolate at 72 pounds. Like modern wine connoisseurs, Tartini's hobby, which exists side by side with his musical activities, relied intrinsically on global connections. I've tried to show by exploring this global Tartini brought about by the publication of his music by Le Sen, that his music and his renown during his own time neither originated nor developed in a vacuum, whether geographical, cultural, musical, or otherwise. His music and reputation cannot be disentangled from the networks that brought them to, for example, English ears like Charles Burney's, inspiring his self-described Mecca-like pilgrimage to Padua in 1771, or those of any of Tartini's students from around the world that ventured to the Scuola delle Nazioni like Fagieri that cannot be disentangled from the discourse of Italy as cultural Parnassus that circulated as a product alongside them, and they cannot be disentangled from the polyphony wrought by the mobility of colonial products in European metropoles alongside musical ones. Our historiography might do well to find ways to reflect this. I have sketched only one global Tartini today. There are undoubtedly many others, some of which I'd say we've seen in a few of the papers today. Although, or sorry, all of them though, get us beyond borders. They get us out of Padua, indeed at times out of Europe, out of clearly delineated categories and into a web of connections that reminds us that Tartini's music, just like all the rest, has always been mobile. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? In the hall. Fabio Stern. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caleb. That mm. was fantastic. I, um, I was wondering about many things, <laughs> but one that came to mind is at some point you talked about um, sort of an object entanglement. And what came to my mind, maybe I've had too much coffee, was um, a sort of like instead of an object oriented ontology, mm. almost an object entangled ontology, mm -hmm. especially when you mentioned the story of chocolate, which is hilarious. But I almost for a moment thought that you could write, I don't know, um, my question is, would you want to write mm -hmm. a history of this, um, <laughs> of this music that gets, that is mobile through these connections, almost in parallel as Tartini's conception of, of chocolate? Do you think mm -hmm. that might be maybe kind of like a sort of like a bold maybe too, too wide cultural net if you want, but maybe it's, it would be something that would highlight a bit like you did in this presentation. But could you manage into writing an uh, almost kind of like this parallel history of entangled objects, of entangled commodities? Yeah, thanks for the question. I, I think you could probably quite easily. Um, there would need to be, and for sure this gets us out of dealing with Tartini, especially specifically, right? Um, I, following a commodity like chocolate or coffee for that matter, um, I, I think you can't separate them necessarily from musical, just music in period in Northern Europe, especially at this time, right? You're, you've got people performing these things in coffee houses. Um, I think about, you've got a lot of literature right now, like the, um, discussing like box silver coffee set, right? That's David Dursley, same kind of thing. Um, I, I, I think I would love to see some sort of parallel um, discussion going on in terms of an entangled ontology. Um, mostly because I think two things, number one, it would give us a completely perhaps different dimension on 
reception studies, not just of Tartini, but of music in the first part of the 18th century period. Um, and then secondly, to see just further how, again, how far these networks go. Um, uh, for sure, uh, I'm thinking of Dr. Scuderi's presentation this morning, and she's going, we have a name and that's it. Um, and I think, especially for research like that, where we're going, okay, well, where can we find and understand some of these students, where are they coming from? Going through an entanglement process or analyzing those entanglements with other products might just be where we find evidence for something like that. Yeah. So yeah, I think it would be a very fruitful. Yeah, approach. thank you. Is there anyone else? Hi, very nice presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. Good. Um, Thanks. Maybe this is less a question, more a comment, but I was just reminded of the a sort of anecdote about the first copyright case related to music in the 18th century, which actually- Johann Christian Bach. Exactly. 1777, <laughs> that's right. Yes, yeah, indeed. And I thought it was an interesting point to bring out um, how um, a lot of those issues dealing with the, the circulation of manuscripts and prints really dictated a lot how composers distribute their music, like how Mozart kept all his concertos to himself because he was afraid that, that he would not be able to sell them or play them himself, for instance. So yeah, but thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. Thanks very much. Very good, thank you. I see on the program, I have 15 glorious minutes to close. I will take one uh, and then we will, some of us here in person, we'll head off to, uh, to dinner and we will reconvene at 7 p.m. for uh, yet another amazing concert in this space. Um, I just wanted to, um, to point out the, uh, the elegant arc that we have traversed over the course of this day from uh, the local Tartini, if I can say that. We li quite literally began at Tartini's house in Piran this morning. And uh, here we are having traversed this arc and we arrive at global Tartini. And we, are, we have gone from thinking about sort of where it all began and Tartini in, in place, in a very sort of particular place. And we are now left as we wander over to the restaurant to, uh, to think about the, um, the, the, the spread of Tartini and sort of more broadly, the, the spread of music and the, uh, uh, as you say, connections, networks and, and circulation. And if I can, if I can extend that, that a little bit and say, this is you know, precisely what we're, what, what we're doing here I'm, that I'm so pleased that we've been able to do that even with, that we are connected with colleagues in, uh, in Europe we have um, colleagues who are sort of here locally. We have some people who have, who have flown uh, here to join us in person. So this itself has been, a, a, I think, a very fruitful, very enjoyable and enlightening activity of uh, making new connections, um, circulating ideas. And, and while, uh, as Caleb pointed out, Tartini is, is uh, conspicuous in his absence in, in historiography. Uh, and here we are, you know, sort of a very small group, you know, arguably, or at least sort of on the surface, you know, dealing with a highly specialized kind of rarefied um, topic. And yet at the same time, what we've seen over the course of the day is that everybody's talking sort of more or less about Tartini or about early 18th century music. Um, and, and yet these, pa these papers and these approaches have been so, um, so varied. Um, all of the papers, if I can say, have been of, uh, I think really, impressive and, and high quality. But what's been so um, delightful to me and surprising, I, I had no idea at the outset of this uh, initiative whether or not we would receive, well, whether we would receive abstracts at all, but whether we would receive a series of abstracts, you know, that were sort of rather narrowly focused in the sort of um, traditional musicological vein. And uh, 
it, it feels like uh, these nine presentations that we've had today have really sort of explored a, a, the spectrum not, and, and not just dealt with Tartini's music um, in, a, in, in a tightly focused way, but rather we've, uh, we've sort of, we've zoomed in at times, we've zoomed out at times, uh, and we've had sort of, sort of wonderful micro and macro perspectives on, uh, on, on Tartini and his, uh, his life and his times. And again, thanks to Caleb, now we are left walking away, thinking about these sort of much bigger issues of uh, decolonizing uh, musicology for that matter. That is something we'll talk about over dinner. I'm sure we'll sort that out over dinner. Um, I'd like to, just before we go, I'd like to uh, acknowledge and thank Russ Baker, who is here. Thank you so much, Russ. And before uh, Russ was here, Pat, Pat Strain and uh, both of whom were responsible for, uh, for all of the technology and for making the recording possible. And so of course, we wouldn't be able to do this without you and thank you. Thanks for keeping us calm and confident that everything was, was running as it, um, as it should be. So, um, and it just remains for me to thank, uh, to thank all of you, the participants who are here, um, the participants who joined us online. And um, I will say too, when when I was uh, when the call went out and when we selected these papers and started to put together the program, I think I asked all of you if you would be interested in in continuing this project and looking ahead to the possibility. Um, again, given given the fact that there is so much more to say about Tartini and so much to to think about, and that Tartini does indeed um, connect in a lot of interesting. Um, in a lot of interesting ways um, that we will we will think hopefully sometime into the future about about publishing these uh, these very interesting papers. So I will say stay tuned for now. And again, thank you all very much. And we are adjourned for the moment for dinner, and we will come back for uh, our concert tonight. Thank you. <laughs>